and many more issues. My surgery is one week from today. My surgery is one week from today. My surgery is one week from today. <laughs> it's my last week without a penis. What do I do? I don't know. I don't know what to do. What does one say? What does one say when a week from today I'm going to wake up with a dick? I don't know, but I'm happy. Oh. I might officially be too big for this shirt. <laughs> One bicep is not fitting and the other is, so maybe I'm doing something wrong on this side. This is a shirt from pre-transition. Uh, so my muscles, not really, I don't wanna get rid of this shirt, but I think I'm too big. Damn me and my muscles, ah, so inconvenient. This is the worst thing to happen to anyone. Funny enough, this is called boyfriend cut. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the style of shirt. Now I am the boyfriend. This is the, this is the final stage in evolution. <laughs> Look at my art. I made art. My friends came over and we painted. We, <laughs> they, they got canvases and stuff and we, uh, we, made, we made some cool art. Now I did not know what this painting was going to be. Uh, and we just, I started just drawing some dicks, uh, as one does. The masculine urge to just draw penises on everything. Having a penis doesn't make me a man. Wanting to draw penises on literally everything and just talk about dicks all the time makes me a man. <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter, you know I do those jokes all the time, is that having a penis doesn't make me a man. Not knowing that I have to wash sheets and towels makes me a man. You know, like, I'm filling in, I do those jokes all the time. Here's another for you. Anyway, I started with just drawing the dicks and I was like, I, I will figure it out as I go because that is how all of my content gets made. I do not really have a, a an idea of what my video is going to be when I start making it. I just, uh, I just kind of start and then do whatever feels right. And then it ends up at, we, we have a lesson at the end and it hasn't steered me wrong yet. But I started drawing dicks in three different colors, gray, purple, and blue. And I realized while I was drawing the dicks, I was trying so hard to draw uniform dicks. I was trying to draw them the same way every time. And it ended up being that, no, I can't draw the same dick the same way every time. All of the dicks are so individual and so unique. And it was impossible, like none of those are exactly the same penis. And I realized what a, uh, an analogy, is that the correct word? It's, it's a metaphor. No two dicks are the same, no two people are the same. And, you know, I, I thought at first maybe drawing dicks was going to make me feel dysphoric because, you know, like, oh, I, my penis isn't going to look like this, at least not right away. You know, I don't, I get a scrotum, but I don't get ball <laughs> implants until stage two. But surprisingly, it made me feel so good to draw those penises. Because no matter what I do, my dick is not going to be perfect because no dick is perfect. I've seen some pretty spot on beautiful penises. Uh, that one guy in Scotland. That other guy in Scotland. The Scottish make good penises, apparently. But no two dicks are going to be uniform. And that's what makes them so special. Every penis that I drew on that thing is special in its own way. One ball is bigger than the other, one droops at a different length, one of them is longer, some are shorter, and they're all fucking great. You know what, that's what we need to take away from this. See, I just, I don't plan on these things and then they, you can find a lesson in everything. And that's life. That is my, my method for life is just that everything is a lesson. The more life you experience, the more life lessons that you have to draw from. And once I was done drawing the dicks, I was like, I'm going to just put a big yellow smiley face in the middle and that will be the painting. And it's beautiful. You know, I, I love things that have a story to them and that's, that makes it that much more special. I don't really have a lot of artistic ability in physically creating things like uh, paintings or drawings or anything. I'm, I can draw a stick figure. Uh, so I didn't think that I would be able to draw anything that I would legitimately want to put on my walls, but this thing fucking rules and it's special to me because I created it with friends and I can tell people, yeah, I painted that right before I went into surgery. You know, they make you do it <laughs> when you're going to get phalloplasty, they make you uh, draw as many dicks as possible to make sure that it's something that you really want. <laughs> Not sure if it's just a law in Texas, but um, but I've completed it and I passed. Now they'll let me have my dick! I think it's done. Oh god, that's gonna be the hard part. Oh fuck, that doesn't look like a two. <laughs> well, it's supposed to be JJN2021, you know, JJN21. I'll mark it on the back, you know, just to... <laughs> 
just to make sure, but uh, yeah, it's done. My sex drive has still been chugging along. I don't want sex. I don't want to physically be in a space with another person, like I was saying in the previous vlog. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really... I, I feel ready to just, like, have my dick and, and I'll just wait for sex with another person until then. Uh, but that does not mean that my sex drive has slowed down. In fact, it's increased. I am the most horny, healthily, I think I've ever been. When I first started T, my sex drive was, like, through the roof. Um, but now I'm, I'm jerking off, like, at least once a day, sometimes twice, and it's been consistent. Yeah, this is the most healthy my sex drive has ever been. I don't really feel like hooking up with other people, um, but I, but I am very horny, because I'm, it makes sense. I'm the most confident and happy that I've been in my body and my mind, and when you are like that, you know, you, you, you feel sexy. <laughs> I feel sexy, I feel good, things are going great. I'm rendering these uh, Pink Blue episodes, all the vlog series weeks uh, one through 10 right now, and I'm uploading them to YouTube as, as I'm talking to you right now. This is a weird meta thing, huh? Where I'm talking to you and you might've just saw the video because if you're watching them in order or you're, you're binging through these, then you have seen that video as I'm uploading it right now. Whoa, that's fucking... I have no proof of this actually helping. I don't know if it will help. I always want to be doing as much as possible to give myself the best chances at things. So I don't know if anything that I'm doing will help my arm heal as best as possible and as quickly as possible, but I'm hoping it will. I'm doing as much as I think, you know, like I'm doing as much things as I think will help uh, give me the best chance and, and the fastest recovery. And these things are lotioning the skin. I'm making sure to, to lotion, what is it, CeraVe? I use CeraVe lotion um, that's like, it's free of like scents and all kinds of anything, you know, it's what my dermatologist recommended to me when I was breaking out in the rashes because uh, my skin is sensitive. He was like, don't use scented lotion, all these things. I recommend CeraVe. And I was like, cool. And I've been using it and it's great. So I've been lotioning the arm, especially the urethra, urethra, urethra area, trying to make sure it's all good. I've been working out. Like I said, I've been focusing on the, the arm muscles, making sure I have the strongest arm possible before we go into surgery. And I've also been doing exercises where I'm stretching it, where you know you slowly do this, where you're kind of rolling the wrist in this direction, and then you go the other direction. Um, and you know I do these usually because uh, I work on the computer a lot. Hey, baby. I work on the computer a lot, and so I want to make sure I don't get carpal tunnel. So you also do these things where you're like, you do this 10 times on each finger. And I'm hoping with the combination of all of these things that, you know, something's got to work. If I'm, if I'm just preparing my arm as much as possible, I just realized I'm giving you the finger. Don't, don't focus on the... <laughs> That's the thumbnail. No, it's not. Yeah, I'm just hoping that because my arm is the strongest and the most limber that it's ever been, that it'll help. And if not, then at least we try it. The thing about this surgery specifically is that there's a lot of misinformation on the internet and the guys who have good results, they just, they leave the internet because it's a bad place to be. So although people get really good results and people have like really perfected like as much as possible, this surgery and this technique and all that, there's not a lot of information on like what to do to help and stuff because it's like people aren't really talking about it. I'm the little guinea pig. Oink oink. Let's... <laughs> Let's see if me doing these things will help. I know guinea pigs don't, they don't oink. What if they did? Oh, that'd be so fucking cute. Can you picture a little guinea pig oinking? It was a little fuzzy face. That'd be great, that'd be cute. I leave tomorrow, I'm excited. I get a haircut today and um, you know, my friends are staying over at my place. So I'm making sure to make the house as good as possible, you know, clean up a bit and make sure there's sheets out for them and uh, and all the things that you're supposed to do to, to be a good host. And I appreciate them staying here, uh, you know, while I'm while I'm away and keeping my cat some company. Yeah, I'm so fucking stoked. I don't know what else to say. I just did my last workout uh, before I leave. Did I say that already? I don't know. I'm gonna be working out in the hotel that I'm at. Um, I'm about to leave to stay six nights in a hotel before I shit my brains out. Let's, let's fucking go. I am about to do my tea shot and uh, I was thinking, 
oh wow, this is gonna be the last tee shot that I do by myself for a bit because uh, I'm gonna have to have other people help me do it. You know, okay, after surgery, I'm gonna have one hand uh, for a bit. And then I thought, oh my God, this is the last tee shot that I'm doing where I don't have a penis. I think that's the bigger thought that I should be focusing on. Whoa. This is the most I've packed literally in my entire life, like for any trip. I, I am a one bag kind of guy. This is giving me anxiety, but I do need all of this. Um, so I have three bags, three main bags here. One is for before the hospital, which is the purple one, all my stuff that I need before uh, any surgery or anything. Uh, the black bag. Yes, there's more. Sorry. I have pillows here because someone's staying at my house and I need to get them fresh sheets and fresh pillowcases. So the, so the purple bag is my numero uno bag. <laughs> the black bag is for my hospital stay. It's specifically everything I need for the hospital. Then afterwards, it's the royal blue and the periwinkle bags. And, uh, yeah, four bags, and also my camera bag is back there. It's the little black one. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, yeah, this is this is the most I I and I need all of it. I need all of it, and you know what? I'm not going on a bus, so it's fine. Everything's fine. This is it's so much, but you don't you you need a lot. The checklist that they give you, and then the checklist I made myself. I'm and it's warranted. I'm staying in Austin for like a, an entire month. You know, like four weeks. This is, um, this is everything that I need. I just got finished working out. I, I lied and I did another workout. I said in the previous video that that was going to be my last workout in this house for a while uh, before I leave for stage one. But I just did another workout because I want to push myself and I'm also just a, just a nuts fucking person. Um, so I did another workout, uh, not letting my body rest. I repeat, everything's fine. I'm so excited. I'm really excited. Um, my friend who is driving me is going to be here in a matter of hours. So I'm going to catch a few hours of sleep and then I will be headed to Austin with all my fucking bags. Last time I'm gonna be able to hold you for a while, buddy, okay? My arm's gonna be a little, a little not strong for a bit, but I'm gonna love you so much. I wish I could just stay here forever. so loud. Yeah. I'll be back soon though, okay? I'm not gonna see you for like a month. It's gonna be a long time. Yeah. I'll be back though. I am leaving my apartment and when I come back things will be very different. Last time I'm experiencing my apartment as I am right now. The painting went there. I think that was a good choice. Yeah, I know. It really does. You know, usually she's very vocal because um, she just wants food all the time. But I think she can tell something is different because I just put a bunch of bags out into someone's car. <laughs> Uh, I as in my friend helped me entirely him. He was the one who went up and down the stairs and I don't want to keep him waiting So I have to go but whew, Let's just soak it in for a sec Okay sec over Time to move on here. We are The place I will shit all of my bowels out in a couple days time I've made it to Austin with me and my 
abnormal amounts of bags for one person. It's so many bags. I, this That was the first thought I had when walking in here, though, is like, oh, I'm going to shit so much in this room. I'm going to be so miserable in this room, and then I'm going to be the happiest I've ever been. <laughs> that is blowing wind directly into my face where I'm recording. Let me just change what the default temperature is right here. Oh, never mind. Never mind. It's staying. It's staying. <laughs> the lighting in here is not going to be what one would call good. I made it. I'm sorry if I sound a little congested. That's what sitting in a car will do. If you're just sitting in the car for three hours, my friend Tim and I got here and I fell asleep a few times in the car because I worked out instead of sleeping, which was a move on my part. Not, the, not a bad move, but certainly a choice. He got some gas out of Bucky's and I went to the bathroom because like, one, it's a Bucky's bathroom. Of course you gotta go. It's an experience. Uh, and, and you know, number two, I don't know what the number two was. There's a bathroom joke somewhere in there. I'm too tired. Anyway, as I was going to the bathroom, like, I, I finished and then I realized this is the last time that I'm going to use a Bucky's restroom sitting down to pee. Which is a crazy thought. I'm so excited, y'all. What the fuck? How is this real? How is this real? It's all hitting me. It's all really hitting me. We got some food, I got some supplies. I, I got everything. I got I got the things I need to empty the bowels. I got some food. I'll just show you. Gatorades. Nothing red or purple. This will go inside the Gatorades. Miralax. Time to go to Dumpsville with these Ducal, Dulca, Dulcalax laxative tablets. These are suppositories. I'm reading now for the first time that these are indeed suppositories. It says, do not swallow comfort-shaped suppositories. Good to know that they are shaped like comfort. I did not know what comfort looked like until now. Fuck! Why is everything going in my ass? Why can't I just swallow things? I don't want this. Fuck, man. Why did I figure this out days before I have to use them? It, honestly, it's really good that I found that out. Oh my god, I was gonna swallow these, y'all. What the fuck would happen to me? You need to- Okay, Dulcalax, let's have a chat. I am not a smart man. I am wise. There's a difference. I'm a himbo. B big boy brain ain't working real well. I- Can you put something more to tell me? I'm- I'm sure a standard person would be able to see this, maybe, and be like, oh. Well, actually, I don't know about that. They just look like pills. They just look like pills. I'm a stupid American. Can you, for the love of God, please put something more on here to tell me that I'm not supposed to swallow these. I know you put in the text, it says here, comfort shaped, and then suppositories is very large. And then it also says, do not swallow. But this is all the same color as the rest of the box text, right? So I did not read that. I read it on a whim just now for funsies. If I did not, honest to God, if I was not making this YouTube video, I would not have had another reason to read this, and I would have just swallowed them. I would have been like, okay, I swallowed them, and how long do I wait? And I might not have seen this thing on the back. Okay, it says, where it says for rectal use only, it is highlighted in a yellow. That's really useful. Put it on the front of the box! Fleet enemas. See, I, I have these enemas that I need. I would not have thought more is going in my ass. I've had experience with you. I know. I know what your. I know what your deal is, buddy. Jello. Nothing red or purple. And the colors are so similar that I'm like, there must be like a red dye or something, a special kind of dye they put in red and purple stuff. Cause like orange is similar to red. Pink is similar to red. Blue? Can I have blue things? Apparently I can. So I'm gonna trust you. These are the only popsicles that were available that have a suitable number of flavors that I can eat because these are. Barking Blueberry, Rough Rough Raspberry, and Soaring Strawberry. I can't have the strawberry, uh, or rather, raspberry. <laughs> okay, sure. Can't have the red ones. And I will be making a donation to a bail fund, uh, because ACAB includes Paw Patrol. That is not a joke. I, I will be making a donation to a bail fund. Oh my god, the back has this thing where you cut out the pups and Ryder, who is apparently a human child, and then you, you shove a popsicle stick up their ass. Okay, that kind of rules. And even though that blueberry flavor looks purplish to me, it says blue 
in the flavor of the popsicle, so I'm gonna trust them. I also got cough drops because it was on a list of recommended things that a trans dude who had gotten foul plastic was like, hey, bring cough drops, and I know why. I think if I had not gone through stage zero uh, surgery before this, I would have been like, eh, it's fine, my throat's not gonna get sore. But having had that experience, I know that the, the tube down your throat it's gonna fuck with you for a while. I couldn't sing or voice act, you know, for a while. I forget when it started getting better, but I, I included it in the vlog. This is why I vlog, because my, I have the memory of goldfish. I need all of this documented so I can look back and be like, oh yeah, I did say that thing. So just in case, cough drops are good to have. So apparently a week out is when everyone starts to acknowledge that you're having surgery, because like, before a week out, you will be like calling people and being like, okay, what do I do with this? What about this? And I have questions, whatever. And they're like, ah, the blah, blah, blah. Then they'll give you the answer. But now they are actively calling me and being like, hey, you're coming in, right? Uh, I received two calls yesterday. One was to schedule my COVID test with the hospital that I'm getting the surgery at. And the second was the nurse who is taking care of me at the hospital to go over my medical history and, and just a few things to make sure they're not gonna put anything I'm allergic to in my body. And she asked if I had any questions, and I was like, well, yes, actually, I need to do my tea shot on Monday night slash Tuesday morning. Uh, can someone do that for me? Because I will not have an arm. And she said, yeah, someone can do that. You just need your doctor to request it. Uh, so I will be asking him that tomorrow because I've got my two pre-ops tomorrow, one with my, uh, surgeon and one with the actual hospital. And I contacted them to ask, hey, uh, how much, can someone tell me how much I'm gonna need to pay the hospital? Because I know they charge differently than my insurance. And it was a whole thing and I'm not sure if I should explain it again because I don't know if I said this in a video or not. Okay, an abridged version is that I called the hospital, asked them, hey, how much do I have to write a check? Like, tell me uh, what uh, what I can, please? And she said, oh, well, I'm gonna need the code for the surgery and also, like, how long the surgery is going to be. So I had to call the Crane Center, ask them, and they were like, ah, goddammit. Like, I don't know why they always ask the patients to do this, because we have to give you a million codes, and it's, it's gonna be a big fucking thing. So, you know, instead, Jesse, and then they gave me information to email a certain person, and tell them the situation, and then they'll be able to give me the information that I need. That was a week ago. <laughs> I'm here for surgery now, uh, and I have not gotten a response. So we will find out tomorrow. A big part of surgery is accepting that you are not going to be as strong as you are for a bit. It takes a lot of inner peace and a lot of confidence and self-assurance in order to give up your power even for a bit. You have to be confident in yourself enough to know, hey, I can rebuild myself. And I've done enough of this to know like, yeah, I've done it so many times and I will continue to do it. Like, this is the big step, but like, yeah, we can do this. I can do it blindfolded, I can do it without a manual, and I've had to. <laughs> and you know what? You get a little better at it every time, and you learn things that you didn't know before, and you become faster at certain aspects. It really is like speedrunning. We're fucking speedrunning gender right now. Comfortable situations do not make strong people. And, you know, it's, it's very cheesy. I say a lot of cheesy stuff, but I honestly mean it. That, like, the hard shit in your life is to make the good shit actually count. Like, it doesn't matter how much good stuff is happening in your life, or rather, it doesn't, no, I was saying it correct. It doesn't matter how much good stuff is in your life, you won't be able to appreciate it if there isn't bad stuff. Uh, if, if everything is, it becomes the new normal. If everything is good, nothing is good. My body is gonna mean so much more to me because I had to pay in blood and sweat and, and fucking earn it. So I appreciate my mom because I'm going to be dealing with a lot of mental stuff. I would love to focus my energy on getting better and healing and becoming one with one's body. And I don't want to have to worry about hospitals sticking me with bills that they won't tell me how much. How much is it? Give me a wink, give me a nudge, a, a number of any kind, slip a paper under my door. What do I need to give you money? I also talked with her about whether I should bring my tray table to the ho hospital. I didn't know whether they would provide one or not uh, and because my mom had colorectal cancer and she's been in in and out of hospitals for a bit, you know? So I asked her, uh, and, and she says that the hospital should have a tray table, like a foldy thingy for me. 
Um, but the trade table will be useful for hotel afterwards. Can you tell I've been in a car for three hours? I need to take a nap. But, uh, I feel good. I feel really good. I've got my two pre-ops tomorrow. I scheduled my COVID test on Thanksgiving because, of course, I want to get it done as soon as possible. And also, I am part white, so I do need to go through some suffering on that holiday. It's a bad holiday, and uh, I'm fine with this. Like I was saying, I think in the week 9 or the week 10 vlogs, I love what Thanksgiving could be. I, I want what it represents in modern day cultural terms. I would love a fall harvest meal where we get to get together with friends and family and feel thankful for things and like share the pie and shit. Uh, I don't want it to be associated with us giving smallpox and destroying an entire nation of people. It feels bad. I cannot enjoy pumpkin pie while that is on my mind. I just don't think we should do genocide anymore, guys. Maybe they'll listen to me. What if I write a letter to President Biden? Dear Mr. President, I gave you all the clues. <laughs> the Snowman was a movie, and you can watch it. I sound so congested. I'm so nuts right now. I don't even know what's happening. I had a good day. I had a good meal with friend. It's time to... It's time to do a sleep. Let's do a sleep. Also, Cheezer is here. Don't worry, he wasn't in the other shot, so I wanted to make sure you knew. Cheezer is here. I almost did not bring him just because I was just going, like, automatic brain going on what's in, on the checklist. Cheezer was not on the checklist because I just assumed Cheezer would be there. Didn't think about it. I'm sorry, little buddy. Everything's good. Everything, everything's fine now. Don't panic. Cheezer's here. I picked up some milk to have uh, with some cereal while I'm here. And uh, I brought a bowl from home and got some dish soap at Target so I can just wash the bowl over and over because I will be drinking copious amounts of broth on Super Bowl Sunday because that's like the only thing I can really drink that has substance. Um, so in the meantime, I got some milk for the cereal and it expires on, if my camera will focus, uh, December 2nd. And by the time this milk expires, I will have had a penis for two or three days. And I am, I'm certainly feeling a certain way about that. It's all coming, it's all real. Once you see an expiration date of milk, where you're like, oh, this thing will have happened by the time that I can't use this milk anymore. I'm feel, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling a certain way. <laughs> I vlogged and then passed out for like six hours and now I'm awake and I'm realizing just how bored I'm going to be here. Hopefully I can just like relax and do some writing or something, but I've been puttering around for like two hours. And so far all I've done is check social media a million times and have some cereal. So we'll see what I do for f four, five more days here, Jesus. It's fine, everything's fine. Cause I can't go for a run right now. Where am I gonna go? It's dark, I don't know the area. Not a good idea. And I can't work out cause I worked out two days in a row instead. I fucked up my workout schedule. You know, because I've just been trying to do it as much as possible, but I also cannot risk getting injured. Like, I don't want to pull anything or fuck up my back or anything before surgery. And I woke up from my nap feeling like, oh, I need to rest this arm. I should not work out today. I should not work out three days in a row uh, for that reason. Because you totally can work out every day. The issue is I go hard. My workouts are four to five hours every day. So if I do it every day, then I will die. <laughs> Surely I will perish. So let's do it every other day, maybe. Um, and I had, it happened to be that my planning out of my workouts worked perfectly where they would end on Saturday where I wouldn't work out Saturday. And then Sunday would be Super Bowl Sunday. Obviously can't do anything then. So I fucked up my work si workout schedule, but you know, we will, we'll do it, we'll make it work. Um, so I won't work out today, which is Wednesday. Thursday I work out, Saturday I work out. So I will be working out up until uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Sorry, I'm realizing now that I, I have two more workouts for a, for a while. They will be my last workouts for a while while I recover. Oh boy, everything's real. Everything's real. That's just the sentence I keep coming back to. There's a lot of like, there's so much fucking planning. There's so much fucking planning! 
All of it is planning and trying to accept mentally that things are happening. But I'm here in Austin. All of the planning is done. And I'm kind of, my workaholic brain is kind of vibrating where I'm like, fuck, what should I be doing? I should be doing something. I, I can do more. I can do something to, to help prepare. But sometimes you just do everything on the checklist and all there's left to do is wait. And that's what we're doing now. Just gotta, just gotta waste some time. I have to just waste some time until Sunday when I can actively do something, which is shit all my guts out. And then Monday is surgery. So let's just waste some time. Waste my time. That was a meme for a bit. I don't know. I like this shirt. I'm glad, I'm glad I brought this shirt. It's a little cold. I turned off the AC. I'm trying to vlog things that are important. But you know what? This is important. It's important that you know the mood that I'm in and the setting. I'm setting the scene. As an actor and a writer, I need to properly project onto you so that you have an idea of what's going on in the room. I want you to know what temperature it is in the room so you can fully absorb this very stupid vlog on YouTube. And now you know that it was chilly, so I so I turned off the AC. Even though it's, it was 69 degrees, I had to. So it's a little less sexy in here, but, but hopefully the outfit makes up for it. I am just turning into a teen wolf, I feel. <laughs> every, every day that goes by, I, I look more like a character in Teen Wolf. I might make that the show that I watch in recovery. Because I had started it. I think it'd be fun if I just watched through Teen Wolf while I'm high on painkillers healing from my penis surgery. I think it's on Amazon. I think it's free on Prime. Well, that's all for now. Maybe I'll take a shower. That's a good way to waste some time. Let's get clean. Oh, I just got back from my pre-op appointments. Uh, yet another folder. Get used to folders. You're gonna have a lot of folders. My friend Andrew picked me up and took me to the Crane Center. Uh, and I... Okay, so a little backstory to this is I am... I'm tired. Like, I, I worked out two days in a row and it just really threw off my rhythm because I'm used to working out... I'm sorry, do I have a solution? I think I... I just put drops in my eyes, so... If it seems like I'm crying, I'm not, and I just felt it on my face, and I was like, are they gonna think I'm s sweaty? I don't know what's happening. Tired, right. So, I, uh, I work out every other day, working out t two days in a row, fucked with my rhythm. I, my, I set my alarm at the proper amount of time so that my friend Andrew would come pick me up, and then we'd go. And I remember laying in this bed, my alarm going off, me turning off the alarm, and me being like, Okay, make sure you don't fall back asleep. And then it, I wake up because Andrew has texted me. And he's like, hey, I'm, out, I'm outside. Just wanted to check on you. And, and I look and I have no time. No time to shower like I wanted to. I will be just a stinky boy going on to this fucking appointment. But I, in my head, I was like, you know what? They're not going to need to take any blood or like, they're not going to be smelling me. Everything will be fine. We'll cut back to that later. Um, so we get to the building and it's in these like, this cluster of buildings that all look the same and they're not labeled very well and I know because I uh, got my hysterectomy done with Dr. Jukes who was in the same place and it took me a bit to make sure I was at the right place uh, the, the first time that I went there. Um, so I go, we, uh, we pull up to what we think is the Crane Center because it says Crane in the name but it doesn't say Crane Center, it says Crane Consultations or something like that. Um, and I'm like, how many other cranes can, this has to be it. But I get out and I'm just still waking up. I, I was able to brush my teeth for like 30 seconds. I, I need to brush my teeth for a full two minutes in the morning or my brain is all, you know, you get in a rhythm if you don't do the thing. I haven't showered. I've been in a car the previous night. My brain is like, Ugh. I woke up at like three in the morning, went back to sleep because I was too hungry and I was like, I can't, I don't have a car, I can't go anywhere. All this backstory is to say that I get to the Crane Center and I don't know what I'm doing. And clearly it looks like I don't know what I'm doing because there is, um, I believe she was either, I don't think, she's not a surgeon, she was, um, someone who worked at the Crane Center was outside the building and could, went in at the same time that I was because she must have been taking a smoke break or something. I don't even remember, because I'm in my own little world, trying to figure out what the fuck is happening. There's no numbers on the buildings that I'm trying to figure it out. But it translates to me just, like, blankly staring at things, and, like, I probably just have this deer-in-the-headlights look of, like, where am I? What's happening? Um, so she's like, you look, where are you, where are you headed, bud? And I was like, uh, Crane Center? And she's like, yeah, yep, 
come on. Uh, and she's like, follow me. I, like, in her tone, I was like, yeah, I look confused, <laughs> probably. Um, so she, uh, we go up the stairs together, and she's, you know, we're chatting, and, um, uh, and I, I get up there. And it's, uh, that was very nice, and something I needed, because, you know, um, it was, it was, I want everyone to be good. I want everyone to be nice, and I want everything to have, be a good experience. And unfortunately, if you are trans, and want health care of any kind, um, doctor's offices usually are not fun. Um, they're, they're usually fine for me because I'm very fortunate that I've gotten my legal name change and my, my sex is male on my driver's license and legally, mentally, physically, I'm male. The only part that's missing right now is the bottom surgery. Um, and yet again, I want to reiterate, not all trans people physically transition, but for my specific situation, this was the last piece of my physical transition. Uh, so there are still a few things that don't feel great. Like, for example, for this surgery where I'm getting phalloplasty, and it makes sense, but I needed to put my sex that was assigned at birth instead of what my actual sex is. Um, so I had to be like, very well, uh, on the form. But it makes sense. And after this, I won't have to deal with that anymore, you know? They want to make sure they're giving me the right parts. It would be awful if I put mail there and then I woke up with a double vagina. <laughs> um, <laughs> all the way across the sky. Anyway, that's what I needed. I needed someone to be nice. And it was a good first sign that the first person, you know, in the physical space of the Crane Center was very kind to me. So I appreciated that. Um, I got inside, and the first thing I see, which I cannot believe my eyes when I see it, and is so good, is a, a basket of eggplant emoji keychains. It's just there. It's perfect. They're self-aware. I feel immediately not tense anymore. I'm like, I'm gonna have a good time here. Okay. It is so good. <laughs> and I text Andrew, and I'm like, guess what they fucking have at their front desk? And he was like, please get one for me. So I snuck in one. Don't tell anyone. I'm, yeah, I'm just putting this on the internet for everyone to see. It's fine. They're so fucking cute, and it's it just they're well made. This is this is very good. And there's a little Crane Center, uh, CraneCTST.com on the back with their with their logo. This is so fucking cute, and I love it. And it's a nice little souvenir. And you know, I'm glad Andrew got one because he is he's he's been a big help in ferrying me around Austin for my uh, stage zero and my stage one appointments, and he'll probably be helping with stage two. So you know what? He's part of this experience too. He gets a keychain. Uh, and as I'm checking in, there's a, a desk directly, like right next to, you know, a kitty corner? Is that what it's called? I don't know. There's a person here, there's a person here, literally right next to each other. And they're like, oh, by the way, if you have the West Lake. Uh, appointment after this. We, we work in the same office, so you will literally just come back here and then they'll take you to a different office in the same office space. Uh, very convenient. Love that. I'm taken back from my appointment and the same woman comes into the room that I had met outside uh, and goes through the basic stuff. She asks um, if I have opinions about Integra and I was like, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't done too much research on Integra. Now I'd like to pause the story uh, to give you a brief little weird mystical thing. If you watch my videos, you know that I have a lot of synchronicities that everything just like the universe sometimes tells me to do things. I'm not crazy. Psh. Anyway, the more that I was looking into getting phalloplasty, the more things started to sync up with different coincidences that were like very, very, they felt very like, what the fuck? And one of them is that there are three different references to the Helsing franchise in all my stuff, Integra being one of them. Integra is, I explain it bad every time I do it, but it's this thing that goes on top of the skin donor, the, the skin graft um, from the donor arm, and it's supposed to help it heal better. More on that later, but it's called Integra, which is a name that is known in Helsing. Pip was the other one, and Victoria is, the third one. Uh, and these had different things labeled, d different things um, having to do with stage 
uh, zero and stage one of alplasty. And I was like, okay, the universe is trying to tell me something. I don't know what it is, but we'll see when we get there. Unpausing the story, she says, okay, well, you know, we're gonna ask. It's, it's something that, like, is fine if your insurance covers it, but without insurance, it's gonna cost you six grand. So you might want to think about whether you want it or not, because the hospital will probably call you to be like, hey, uh, insurance didn't cover it, do you want it or not? And I was like, oh, that's a good point. I don't, I don't know. And she was like, uh, yeah, like, we'll, we'll wait. Dr. Santucci will talk to you about it. Then they gave me this, which is a piston irrigation syringe. This is going to help do something with, uh, with my catheter bag. Uh, and then she left the room and I waited for Dr. Santucci to come in. And as I'm waiting for Dr. Santucci to come in, they give me a consent form, basically, that I have to sign. And it starts to scare me. But you know what? It's okay to be scared. It's surgery. It's a big deal. And even though this is something that I desperately want and that I would give anything to get, it still is scary when someone gives you a paper and says, hey, these are the, thing the things we legally have to tell you could happen. Um, so that you don't sue us. It's really scary to get a form that says, hey, the skin graft could just not take. Um, you might not be able to orgasm again. You might not get sexual feeling from it. Like there, there's a lot of stuff that could happen worst case scenario. It's good to be aware of it, but when you have anxiety, that's the only thing you'll think about sometimes. I am known on the internet. I do not like to think of myself as a known person but the reality of the situation is that I'm here on the internet and I have 40 plus thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel and I have however many followers on Twitter. I'm a member of Team Four Star. I edit for popular YouTubers. People know who I am. And if something goes wrong with this surgery, I'm going to represent all of trans men. And that's scary. It's a scary thing to think that if something goes bad, or something goes wrong, transphobes will be able to point to it and be like, ah, see, the surgery doesn't work. We should kill all the trans people. Like, you know, like just the weird connecting of thoughts where it's like, why are we jumping ship? Uh, or not jumping ship, but jumping to like another, ah, you know, it's, 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 it fucked with me, if I'm honest. And then I stopped to think, hey, you know what? It's fine to be aware of all the bad things that could happen the possible side effects. Why don't we counteract this bad list with the good list? So I started compiling a list of possible good side effects. Phalloplasty side effects may include a boost in confidence, the ability to have sex in a way that makes me feel comfortable and happy, moving throughout the world like I don't feel like a burden, being comfortable to go to bars and clubs and flirt with people and, and not be afraid of trans panic, gaining the ability to pee at a urinal or pee standing up, Gaining the ability to have sex without worrying about harnesses and extenders and, and all the things that I've been stressed about. Being able to go to public beaches that are nude and spa rooms and things where your junk's gonna be on display. All of these are possible side effects that you should be aware of. And okay, all right. And then I felt better. And then Dr. Santucci came in the room and we talked some more. It was very fun to see him. He, he walked in the room and was like, Jesse, the system works, you're here. And I was like, I'm here. Cause it is, it's very different. Like scheduling for a surgery during a pandemic over the phone, it's different to like actually be in the meat space. And it's here and he's here and the hospital is here. And my surgery is Monday and it is happening. And whether my brain wants to catch up with me or not, this is a thing that's going to happen. I've signed all the paperwork. Everything is happening. Literally, I could say no. At any point, I could just be like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, and we can call it a day. But if I want this, then I should let myself have this. I, 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 it doesn't, it wouldn't feel good to be like, hey, I'm gonna be having this surgery and then just be stressed all up until the point where I have it. But you know what? I might because my brain is disaster -y and it keeps going back and forth where it's like, I'm so fucking excited. Like literally just being here in the hotel, this fucking rules. It's a tangible thing. It's a sign that like, it's, I can see the finish line, but I need my brain to catch up with me. My heart is there. It's running. It's ready. Now my brain needs to catch up with my heart. Both of us, we gotta be in this, but whether I'm nervous or not, I'm gonna have that surgery and I'm gonna be happier than I've ever been in my entire life. So let's fucking catch up. So he talks to me about Integra. 
and he says, you know, well, the first thing he says actually is he asks for my opinion, and I really appreciate that because I feel like he he's he's he seems like a really smart guy, and I think he's dealt with enough patience that he doesn't, yeah, you know, like the king doesn't have to say he's the king, you know, like I when I am in conversation with people, I don't I don't want to talk over people. I don't find the need to say I'm better than everyone. I don't I don't find the need to say like, you know, to express that I know more than someone else. I genuinely want to hear what someone else has to say, and then I can give my opinion. And I say, honestly, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. And I explain it in a bad way, which I'm like, is it is it the thing where, you know, when I get a tattoo, it's like uh, they put the second skin on and kind of just let it heal underneath it because you're preserving it. And I could tell in his head, he was like, no, it's not at all like that. But he was very nice and was like, not exactly, and then went on to explain it. And I was like, oh yeah, that's nothing. Like, that's that's just nothing like what I said, thank you. <laughs> but he explained what it does, and what it boiled down to, um, essentially, was that he was like, is it, this is, this is a very abridging of what he said, but he was like, you know, we, we try to get it reduced price as much as possible, but now it's down to like 6,000 instead of $12,000. And is it worth $6,000 more? And honestly, I don't think so. Uh, and he said that he probably w he wouldn't do it if he was getting the surgery. Um, and it's you know all up to everyone individually, but that's just what his opinion was. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, so I'm not going to. If insurance covers it, great, awesome. But one, I don't have six thousand um, dollars. I've eaten up all my savings from the move, so I I literally I think I have like two thousand dollars to my name right now. I'm kind of doing the paycheck to paycheck thing, just trying to make sure I make rent. Uh, so I don't I I don't I'd have to like ask someone else uh, for for the money if I needed to. But but secondly, it's like a fifty fifty shot if the integra even helps even more. So. But we can go without it. Again, though, I'm very much a bridging. Oh, real cool guy. You hear how loud his car is? Wow, big peen on that, buddy. Maybe you need the keychain. But yeah, then he asked if I had any questions, and I did. I had a list on my phone. Uh, pro tip, write down what you want to ask, because especially with me, I will just blank and be like, oh, I guess, I guess I don't have anything I want to ask, because I have so many questions filling my head that it all just makes everything go blank, and I'm like, well, I guess I don't even have one question, because I can't think of any. I asked when glansplasty takes place, because we were confused about that, um, and basically he was like, we try to do it with stage one, you know, to do it while we're there, um, but with skinnier folks, sometimes it's more difficult. So we're gonna go in with the intention that we're gonna be doing glansplasty today, and then if it doesn't work out, then we will, you know, do it with stage two. And I'm fine with that, you know? I'm okay with my, my dick not having a head for a bit. So it's really just an aesthetic thing for me. And you know what? I know. I know it's not gonna... The whole thing is not gonna look the way that it's going to forever. There's gonna be a healing period, and I, I, I've mentally accepted, okay, my dick is not going to look like this forever. If this is the healing stage. Eventually it's gonna get a head, eventually I'm gonna get balls in the... Ah, I just remembered that I didn't ask him about the... Scrotals. Scrotal? Scrotomy? Scrototomy? Scrotal? Scrotalicious? I'm pretty sure they're gonna give me a ball sack and then just not put the balls in and let it heal and then the balls go in for stage two. But I don't know, because Jesse didn't write it on the list! Ah! You gotta write it on the list or it doesn't get asked. I asked if they take a sample from my thigh to put on my arm and he said yes. Um, it's just gonna look like a little road rash on my leg. It's... that's not as intensive, you know. The, the recovery should be fine. I asked him about the nothing red or purple because I wanted to make sure that I can eat those fucking Paw Patrol popsicles even though it's because it looks purple but it's like it says blue and it's so funny because he was like oh, okay they clear I that's so silly I don't I don't know why they put that they clearly just copy and pasted it from a colonoscopy thing you can drink all the red and purple things that you want something red or purple something red or purple I asked if I could take my blood pressure pills the morning of surgery um, and we, we talked about it for a bit because I, I have mitodrine, which raises my blood pressure. And essentially, I'm not smart enough to convey what the problem is with me taking that, but uh, nerves, blood, something or other, 
it's probably not a good idea. We want to give my body the best healing factors that it can, and that might fuck with things. And then I also told him about how I talked to Westlake about my tee shot, and that he has to request that someone give me a tee shot, and he said, you can skip a day. We, we, you shouldn't do a tee shot on the day of the surgery. Um, and then as we were talking more, we talked about my blood pressure and how you know, like, we were talking about basically a bunch of stuff that had to do with my fainting condition. And then he paused because he thought of something, and he asked, did testosterone help with your fainting condition? And I said, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's really, really helped. I've been able to get in shape, I work out every other day. Uh, I was fainting a lot before I started tea. And then he was like, you know what? Do your tea shot on Sunday, which is, you know, the day before surgery. Uh, and I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, so I'm gonna be doing my tee shot just a day early. And that was basically it. Uh, he said he was excited for surgery. I said, I'm excited for surgery. Seems like a really smart, really nice guy. Uh, and yeah, I went back out and then went back in because it was time for my other appointment. The nurse was real nice. We talked about my fainting condition. Uh, we talked about my lab results because apparently my blood sugar was really low. My blood pressure was fine. So that's interesting. I guess I've just been on testosterone and mitodrine for a long enough time that my body has evened out and I don't have the low blood pressure if I'm taking my uh, medicine consistently. And she suggested, hmm, maybe if you, you might want to look into the future getting one of those, um, I, she used the correct word for it, I don't know what it is, but the machine that pricks your fingers so you can test your blood sugar levels? Because I might be dealing with a glucose something or other that I just haven't gotten diagnosed. Because we, we talked for a while, we went extensively into like, oh, I started fainting at age three, no one could figure out what was wrong with me. Eventually, like six years ago, I did an EKG, like a bunch of tests, one where they did the ultrasound on my heart, one where I was running on a treadmill, and one where it was the tilt table test. And the tilt table test, I was strapped to a table, they tilted me upwards, I fainted like, immediately. Um, I've, tell, I've told this story before in one of the videos, of, uh, one episode of Pink Blue, but usually with that tilt table test, I ask them like, hey, how long does it take a, a usual person on average to faint when they tilt them upwards? And they're like, yeah, usually it takes like a minute or two, you know, they don't really notice, and then all of a sudden they just stop talking. When they've tilted me up, it was like 10, 15 seconds. <laughs> and she was like, you know, this other doctor might find that interesting. And then he eventually came in, she went through all the details and he was like, that's interesting, that's interesting. And then like, it was very funny that like, I went my entire life with no one taking my fainting condition seriously. And then these two doctors are just like, and they're being like, wow, and then what happened? And like trying to diagnose me and trying to figure out like, this is so interesting. Like, and then what do you do with this? Um, so that felt good. Cause they also wanted to make sure that they are monitoring everything correctly when I'm hooked up to the machine. So she was like, yeah, let's make sure we monitor his, uh, his blood sugar level and make sure everything is good. And they were trying to figure out when they can put me back on mitodrine because on the third day of staying in the hospital, that's when I get up and they try to get me to start walking around. And that's going to be difficult if I don't have my blood pressure medicine. So he had some questions for Dr. Santucci. So he left, talked to him for a bit, and then came back. And I apologize because I am tired and I do not retain smart information, like science things correctly. Um, but essentially he said there was another thing that they could put me on, so they're gonna give me a sample of that and we'll see if that works. Essentially, he kept talking about how mitodrine is just not a medicine that they see being given to a 29-year-old. He usually sees it when, they're, when it's like 80-year-old men. So they can give me something that they couldn't give the 80-year-old men because they're afraid that their heart's gonna fucking explode or some shit. <laughs> but he said it should be fine in me. So we'll find out. She did a little test on my heart. She hooked up all the things, made sure that was good and then they sent me on my way. The prescriptions that I needed to pick up for after surgery were sent to a pharmacy, and I went to pick them up, and I got a whole fucking bag of goodies. This is sodium chloride irrigation, uh, and there's a bunch of little vials in here. They want me to take a syringe with the little vial and then stick it in there to like inject and put that stuff in there. And I will use this to flush my catheter. Here is a tip from me to you. When I got my stage zero surgery, they gave me a special soap that you have to, you know, um, it helps prevent infection and you wash with it, uh, at least for that surgery, I washed with it the night before surgery and then the morning of. 
Um, and it's a soap that, like, it's such a confusing soap because there's so many warnings and so many bad things that can happen. They're like, hey, make sure you don't get it above your uh, neck because if it gets in your ears or your eyes, you could go blind or you could have deafness or, like, whatever the fuck. Um, it's very bad to put above your head. But put it on this other part of your body. It's very important you put it on the other part. I'm like, what the fuck? I've never been so anxious washing with something. I was just like in the shower, just I remember just being like, please don't, don't accidentally splash, don't touch me, I don't know what's happening. But that soap was also required for this surgery and I wanted to wait and see if the hospital was gonna give it to me for free because they did with my other surgery. Uh, for this surgery, they did not. I had to go pick this up myself uh, at the CVS. Fluorhexidine, Fluorhexidine, glucotinate. Glucotinate. 4% solution. It's a soap. It's the danger soap. I got the generic brand. It was like 12 bucks. Um, but if you are getting the other surgery, maybe keep the soap. I threw it out because we were like doing a lot of traveling and I thought I would not have to use it again. But uh, yeah, I uh, and I'm also not a medical professional. There might be a thing where once you open it, you need to use it within a certain amount of time. Ask your doctor. But uh, it's, it, at least to me, I wish that I had saved the previous soap just to ask. Just to ask, like, hey, can I, can I use this soap? It's from four months ago. After that, we got something to eat, and then Andrew and I went to a supermarket-type area, and you'll never guess what was out front. A bunch of vegetables. Guess what one of them was? We were meant to go. We were meant, we were meant to go to this market. I got some pumpkin spice milk and a ginger cookie. Let's see how this is. Oh, wow, that is actually delightful. That will be a lovely thing to have with my cookie. Yeah, if you're gonna have surgery and you're scared, that's okay. You know, it's supposed to be scary. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And also if we had proper healthcare in America. I was talking to Andrew about how I'm wearing my Spider-Man shirt to surgery. I, I wore it to my LASIK appointment because I was like, Spider-Man wouldn't be scared, but I guess he would. And Andrew was like, yeah, you know what? That's that's what Spider-Man is. Peter is fucking terrified of everything he's doing, but he does it anyway. And that's what being a hero is. It's being scared and doing the scary thing anyway. He's fucking quipping. He's fucking shitting his pants while telling jokes to dudes that could rip him in half. And he keeps getting up and doing it. Being brave doesn't mean that you aren't scared. There's, there's no reason. I mean, there are reasons to be, to be scared of the surgery, but like the pros, so outweigh the cons that there, there's no way that I wouldn't get it. I would do anything, I would do anything to, to have a dick. So of course I'm gonna read the, the scary things that could happen and I'm gonna do it anyway because it's fucking worth it. It's fucking worth the risk. I don't know what happens with my story. I don't know what happens in the future, but all I can do is live for now. And you know what? I don't represent all trans men, not all trans dudes want to get surgery. Not all trans dudes can get surgery, but this is my story and I get to write it how I want. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks of it. If I don't get this surgery, I will regret it for the rest of my life. So, let's see what happens. Yeah, you could fall, but dude, what if you fucking fly? <laughs> oh, I'm less tired now, which is funny because I just worked out. So you'd think I'd be more tired. I took a nap, took a real good nap, uh, there's, do not underestimate the power of a good nap. Power nap. It wasn't really a power nap. Is it a power nap? I don't know how long I slept. Oh wow, I have too much energy now. Um, <laughs> I just got back from doing my second to last workout, making it fucking count. I really pushed myself. Um, I will at some point, maybe now I'll give you what my workout routine has been throughout the weeks. Um, and I think, like, I love numbers that end in zeros and fives. And legit, I think that my brain made me work out two days in a row to even it out so that it is 30 even workouts. Um, so congrats, we did it. It wasn't a goal anyone was telling me to meet, I just did. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a good sign, it's a good sign. I got a long ass charger cable, two of them. Um, one of them is C and one of them is micro USB, is that what it's called? I don't know, one goes to my tablet, uh, and to my speaker, and the other goes to my Raycon earbuds, and to my phone. Uh, and they recommended getting a long one, and I had already done that. So, hooray! I think I got like a 10 foot one and a 6 foot, um, and they both plug into one thing, and that's good. 
for the hospital. Recommend getting a long cable because you don't know where the outlet's going to be or if one of them doesn't work or whatever the fuck. And speaking of which, she warned me ahead of time that the Wi-Fi is not great in the hospital, which is good because my phone can turn into a hotspot. Uh, recommend doing that if you have a phone that is capable of that. Uh, it's been very useful in the past. So before I go on with what I wanted to talk about, I remembered a few things from my appointment, uh, my pre-op at the Crane Center, that I just did not remember because I was a sleepy boy. The first was a question that I asked him just because, like, I know it's a ridiculous question, but my mom, you know, I, I wanted to ask for my mom because she had a concern. Um, and I prefaced it with that. I was like, I get to ask a question, but I think I know the answer. I don't know. And he, and he you know, cut me off and was like, don't worry, just ask me. Like, totally fine, let's do it. Um, which is great. I feel very comfortable talking with him. He's, um, uh, out of all the doctors that I've done with transition stuff, he's been genuinely, like, the most approachable, and I feel comfortable, like, asking him anything, and we talk frankly about, like, the body parts and shit. So I, just a note. I like Dr. Santucci, and not just because he said I was smart, <laughs> but that sure helps. My mom's friend's son, and I'm saying Connecticut, but I do not know if it was Connecticut. It might have been a different state. He got phalloplasty, and he was not able to orgasm after surgery, and, like, it was apparently a thing that, like, the doctors knew, like, you won't be able to orgasm afterwards, so he was rightfully very upset about that. Um, and so my mom was concerned about that, and I was like, no, like, I'll, it, the chances are not, they're not approaching it with, you definitely won't be able to, like, I, you know, kind of explain the situation. But I wanted to ask, just to ask, ask the questions, you know, and it'll make you feel better. So I asked him about that, and he went through the statistics of, like, how m the percentage of dudes who gain tactile function in the penis, how many sexual, uh, how many could orgasm, all, all that shit. And some, even if I'm not able to orgasm through the penis, some, like, use a vibrator on the base of the dick because that's where my T-dick is gonna be implanted, like a little mecha pilot, and, um, are able to orgasm that way. So, it really just seems like, worst case, I will be able to orgasm through my T-dick still. So, that's fine. I already felt good, and now I feel even better. Because I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm the perfect candidate. And apparently if you're skinny, you're the best candidate for ATL. So like, apparently I am a perfect candidate for ATL, even though I'm getting, um, RTF? I really shouldn't know the vocabulary before I talk about things, but we're not gonna let that stop us, which is interesting. But, you know, ATL, for me personally, it's, the dick just comes out a little too thick for my liking. Um, so, and, and the best results are usually, like, with arm, so sticking with arm. But also, it'd be a wild move if I switched right now. I don't know if that'd even be possible. I've already gotten the electrolysis on my arm, and I just will, I'll just have an arm that just doesn't get hairy. No, we'll, look, let's do it. We're, we're doing this. And also, I had my pre-op with the hospital, and I, they didn't ask me to pay anything. Maybe I could just sneak in through the door and just sneak out, and they won't ask me to pay anything? I don't know. Let's just cross our fingers that maybe, even if they have to charge me money, like, they look at me and they're like, oh. You can just get it for free. You get out of here, you scamp. I've charmed my way out of worse. When I woke up from my nap, I had a very tough time trying to figure out what to eat because I'm in walking distance from some fast food places, but you don't know what time the actual dining area closes. Uh, and so I had to order Grubhub and I just agonized over it for like 30 minutes because I'm at a hotel. And in my head, I was like, I don't know if I want to order Grubhub to a hotel. Maybe they won't am I causing trouble for someone? Will they not know what to do? Uh, are they gonna try to come up to the room? And then I'm like, oh no, I'll come down to the lobby. And I stopped after half an hour thinking about this. I mean, like, Jesse, you're literally getting penis surgery on Monday and you're scared to order Grubhub. This is... Boy, trauma, you've ruined a perfectly good himbo. Look at him, he's got anxiety. I understand why trans dudes are so hot to some people because we have the lived experience of being female, which means we get hot and confident, but we still have an anxiety disorder. <laughs> also, because I have to do my tee shot on Sunday, and that's a whole day, maybe a little bit more than when I usually do my shot, I just wonder if my acne's gonna get worse. Is my acne gonna get worse for like a week? Because you might remember when I was on bi-weekly shots instead of weekly, my acne got really bad. Uh, and my sex drive was through the roof. 
I don't think that'll be a concern this time though. Maybe that's the secret. Maybe that's a life hack. If we just make me so horny, then maybe I will just grow the the grow the nerves back quicker and get feeling in my penis. Let's let's fucking hack this shit. So when I got my prescriptions, I did not tell you that I had to pay seventy five dollars. Uh, and that's that seems like a lot, and it is a lot for like prescription stuff. But also when I didn't have insurance, I was paying three hundred dollars a month for my fucking blood pressure medicine. So. Ugh, thank you, insurance. I got a lot of shit in that bag, and I didn't realize it until I started reading this uh, phalloplasty post-op instructions. There's a lot of shit on there, and I looked in the bag, and I have eight pill bottles. Eight pill bottles, the big bottle that's full of the stuff that goes in the catheter, and the little bottles of, like, little injecty things that you put in the stuff that goes in the catheter. And once we mix that, we are going to refrigerate it. You don't have to refrigerate it while they're separate, but when you put them together, Gotta refrigerate it. So yeah, I thought we would go through this handy dandy list and uh, give you an idea of what's going to happen, as well as me. This is a teaching moment for both of us. But yeah, you know that fucking paper that you get when you get prescriptions that are that's like, here's the information and here's how much your insurance paid and all that. This, this is how many I have. This is so much, this is stacks of them. So I should have known it was gonna be a lot of prescriptions, but yeah, let's fucking get to it. Phalloplasty post-op instructions. Here's the general stuff. Medications. When discharged, resume all your preoperative medications. It's very important for you to keep your pain under control. Take your pain meds every four to six hours for the first five to seven days after discharge. Then adjust your pain medication schedule to an as-needed basis. Take your pain medicine about an hour before dressing change, post-op appointments, or physical therapy appointment to avoid unnecessary discomfort. That's a good sign. You're gonna be in a lot of pain, maybe account for that. Maybe factor that in. And then it tells me that it's safe to take Tylenol and Advil together, and I may want to also alternate them since they impact different pain receptors, which is what I did for stage zero. And it also notes that some of your opiates will contain acet acetaminophen. Sure. Be aware for the 24-hour maximum dose. So yeah, just be aware you can't take so much of those all all at once in 24 hours. Which is one of the reasons that it's very good for someone else to be there. My mom will manage my medications for me because I will be high. Bladder spasms. With a suprapubic, oh, I love, love the word bladder spasms. With a suprapubic catheter, it might be necessary to take medication, oxybutanin, for bladder spasms. A bladder spasm may feel like you need to urinate but can't. Pain in the bladder or lower abdomen, discomfort in the perineum, or fluid, urine, blood, or yellow slash brown leaking from the phallus. Be aware, in all caps, oxybutonin may cause dry mouth, blurred vision, difficulty swallowing, dizziness, and drowsiness. Chew gum, drink plenty of water, or suck on a hard candy to help. Anxiety, speaking of which, surgery is stressful and anxiety producing for a lot of patients. We frequently prescribe an anti-anxiety medication, lorazepam, aka Ativan, to take as needed. And I realized when I read this, like, oh fuck, do I have an anti-anxiety fucking medication? And I looked, and they did prescribe it to me, and that's good, I didn't think about that. I'm very grateful for that, because, yeah, this is a big fucking deal. It's normal to feel fucking anxious when you're, like, laying there in a hospital bed and being like, I was cut open today! Remember, it's there for you to take if you need. This may also be a time to reconnect with your counselor or support person. Compression socks or devices. Wear compression socks or use your prescribed devices to prevent post-surgical blood clots. I wonder what the devices are. Pump your ankles while sitting or lying in bed. Walk 10 minutes, three times a day. And that'll be after they start letting you walk. Graft site wound care and dressing changes. And on this page is a actual, they provide actual pictures of people who have had phalloplasty, like their penises are here on the page. Um, which is why I'm not showing you, and the the dressings are here, and the suprapubic catheter is, is there, and it's really useful to see this information. Because they can describe to you what a suprapubic catheter is, like, till the cows come home, but, like, seeing it here is like, okay, good. Remember we were talking about himbo brain? You need to fucking show me this shit. So, yes, good. Also, shout out to whoever's penis I'm looking at. Props to you, bro. Thanks. Whether you've had an ALT, parenthesis thigh, or RFA, forearm, phalloplasty, oh, good. RFA, I said that before. You'll have several wounds that need to be cared for daily. Also, this is random. I'm just realizing that my hair is, like, probably very messy because I just got out of the shower and then I put some stuff in it. Hope it's good. Anyway. And then they label suprapubic tube insertion site, cat secure, and flip flow. I don't know if I'm going to get a flip flow. 
Um, but we will see. I don't know what Flip Flow does, but I've heard guys talk about it. I assume, like, it's... <laughs> what I think it is, it probably isn't. I picture that it's like a vacuum cleaner, but not even a vacuum cleaner. Um, one that, like, you can reverse the flow. So I'm picturing that you flip the switch and, like, pee comes out of uh, the catheter into the bag. But then if you reverse it, then it goes back in. That's probably not a good, that's probably not what it is. I don't think bladder, I don't think pee is supposed to stay in the bladder. Pee is stored in the balls, as we know. And it labels skin graft donor site, flap donor site, and phallus is in neutral position with gauze roll. So in this picture, they've got the dick and then like a roll of gauze and it's like being supported. It's just kind of like, just chilling, just vibing. Shopping list, this is what I was talking about before where they have a, a package that's like $250 that has fucking everything you need. Um, you know, non-stick dressing, gauze, A, B, D pads. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's for if I leak? I assume there's like puppy pads, Q-tips, roll of gauze, all that stuff. Um, or you can just buy it yourself. I, I'm just gonna get it from them. I think they would know better than me how much I need. Showering. Showering daily is an important component of good wound care. Have someone present while you're in the shower. A uh, shower chair or plastic stool can be helpful. Shower daily and cover the donor site. You can use a pre-made plastic arm cover for RFA or saran wrap. Don't let the water run directly on the donor site. Yes, for that, wow. Yes, for that specifically, I got uh, these guys. Just a big condom for your arm. Gotta, you know, safety first. Plan your shower and dressing changes around your pain medication schedule. Which is what they said before. Glad they're reiterating that. Give yourself plenty of time. It is not unusual for the first few showers with dressing changes to take one to two hours. Ah, cool, great, very cool. Now is the time to be humble. Now is the time to leave my ego at the door. I am going to be sitting in a chair in the shower washing my penis. For your split thickness graft dressing change, you will need someone to help you. Bacitracin ointment, adaptic or zero form non-stick dressing, acrylic gauze, medical tape, scissors, ace bandage. Now for this next part, I don't know if I've actually told you what the arm is going to look like. It's, it's going to look a little gnarly for uh, usually it's like one to three months while it's healing. My arm at first is going to be, I would describe it as like a black, brown, purplish color. Because it's a major thing that you're doing to it. So it's going to look a little Frankenstein-y for a bit. But, I, I, you know, looking at guys' results, around three to four months is when it starts looking like, oh, this is a wound, rather than like, oh, this is... Ah, uh, but I'm gonna feel good from it, if I'm honest. It, I'm gonna feel like I got a cool skateboarding injury or some shit. Except it's a skateboarding injury that gave me a penis, so even cooler. And then it gives instructions for changing that specific area. Partial thickness skin graft donor sites. So this is the area on the thigh. And it says this area will be on your thigh regardless of where your flap donor site is. And then it just gives instructions for that. Suprapubic tube. You will have a suprapubic tube in place until your third post-op visit. This tube is placed through your abdomen into your bladder. There's a suture, stitch, and balloon to hold the tube in place. And stitch is in parentheses, so it's a suture and a balloon. It's not three things. Just want to make sure you know that. There may be a yellowish drainage noted at the SP insertion site. This is normal and can be gently cleaned with soap and water. Do not let water run directly in the insertion site. Use a flip flow device during the day to reestablish bladder tone and connect the drainage bag at night until post-op one. It's okay to just use the flip flow if you are more comfortable with that. So we'll see, we'll see which one I like better. And then it gives the SP tube irrigation and removal, which is a separate uh, whole paper uh, on how to do that in this folder that they gave me. Caring for your phallus and scrotum. I love the title of this, and I honestly do. That's not me being sarcastic. Like, all, everything else has been, like, very medical, but this is the page that I have gotten to just now and been like, right, I'm gonna have a penis. This feels good. This feels cool. How to care for your penis. Most importantly, keep your phallus in a natural position. Keep the area clean and dry. Limit skin-on-skin -skin contact. Place an ABD pad between your phallus and scrotum. Oh, so I wonder what that is. I thought it was a puppy pad, but I guess it's not. It must be something else. Keep your phallus elevated using a roll of gauze, rolled cloth washcloth, or rolled cotton diaper liner. And there's three different pictures of P 
people's penises. I am really enjoying the pictures of penises where it's just chilling on top of the, the washcloth. It, they seem relaxed, they seem at peace. They're just fucking, they're just vibing, bro. Because the other pictures are a bit medical where it's like, here's the catheter going in here, here's the whatever. These dicks, they're just chilling. They look like they're on vacation. I'm mentally picturing them wearing sunglasses. Would it be just one sunglass? You know, like Leela from uh, Futurama? How she'd just have one sunglass instead of like two sunglasses. Just one sunglass on the penis. If a penis had sunglasses, would it wear it like this or this? <laughs> Change the pads frequently if they become soiled. When appropriate, lie down without pants and let air circulate around your groin area. Fuck yeah, just fucking, just vibe, bro. And I love when it says when appropriate. So, I probably, probably shouldn't do that when I'm chilling by the pool. All sutures are dissolvable. Good to know. Vaginectomy. The vaginectomy site has dissolvable sutures in place. Occasionally, a small area of skin may open and have some drainage. This is normal and will heal on its own. It is important to keep this area clean and dry. Do not put any neosporin or bacitracin on this area. And there is science behind that, but I do not know it. <laughs> okay, this part is just called, what is that smell? What is that smell is one of the most common questions asked during the fallow healing process. The surgical sites may have an odor due to sloughing tissue, serous, I don't know if it's supposed to be serious, this might be a typo. I'm just gonna say as it, as it, it says serous, fluid buildup or weeping. Reduced hygiene and post-op wound smell is incredibly common and will resolve. Once the wounds heal and dry, the smell will dissipate. What about the sutures? All sutures you can see are dissolvable. Sometimes a bit of suture will make its way through the skin and feel sharp like a whisker. It is okay to trim it or just leave it alone and it'll eventually fall off. Then they have underwear recommendations. Uh, luckily I already took care of that. Some of our patients prefer underwear that provides separation between the phallus and the scrotum. It is recommended you have a larger size for your initial post-op phase. Yeah, so they're recommending sacks and uh, all those underwear that have, you know, like Separatech where it, where it separates penis from balls. And then lastly, what is that drip? It is normal to have a small amount of leaking from the tip of your phallus. And that's literally all it says. <laughs> and that's the end of the packet. We did it. Now you are prepared as well as I. But the rest of the things in this folder are the super pubic tube drainy thingy instructions. A hand therapy order form, because, you know, my arms, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they, I didn't know they were going to provide this, um, that someone's going to walk me through exercises and stuff to make sure my hand is healing correctly. And on the sheet it recommends that I bring an extra long phone charger, maybe back scratcher, things to do, our internet, super slow, <laughs> you should put that on there. And it says left F.A. fallow. It's happening, y'all. I'm good. I don't know if it's just like the post workout endorphins working in me, but just walking through that whole packet with y'all, I feel better. I feel good. You know, part of this packet says, you know, anxiety, this thing is, this is a process and it's going to be anxious for you. And they say this may also be a time to reconnect with your counselor or support person. And you know what? As cheesy as it sounds, y'all are my support people sometimes. Sometimes all you have to do to solve a problem is just talk it through with someone or at something. This is a little dark, but I'm gonna share with you something. Um, I do not get suicidal, really, nowadays. But there was one or two instances where I just got very, very depressed because of things that were happening in my life. It wasn't because of anything transition-related. It was just, you know, relationships and stuff like that. There, there were some difficult times where I thought I had disappointed some people or that I was scared of someone hurting me and you get depressed from that. And it's important to note that during both of these times, I did not want to die. And that's the difference between pre-transition and post-transition. Pre-transition, I got suicidal and I would want to kill myself. And so I would like plan out how to do it or I would attempt it, you know. Um, and post-transition, the two times that I've gotten so depressed, I knew consciously hey, I don't want to kill myself. I just feel like I want to. So I should take steps in order to prevent me from feeling sad. First time I called Trans Lifeline, and that's a whole story in itself. But the second time, I was even more prepared. And it was like a year or so, maybe more, uh, later, after the, the first time. And so I was even more like, yeah, I don't want to die. My life is fucking great. I'm just feeling sad right now and this will pass. But I need to do something to make myself feel better. So I turned on my camera and I talked to it and I talked about what I was feeling and why I was feeling it and 
it just made me feel so much better. And to the camera, I made a list of pros and cons as to whether I should kill myself or not. And I realized that the cons just way, way outweighed the pros. I think the only pro of killing myself was that I wouldn't feel like I was feeling anymore. But everything else was like, dude, life fucking rules. You have supportive friends and family, you're successful, you're moving to Texas, you've gotten to audition for dream projects, you've booked dream roles, you have so much to give to the world, you're writing series that are gonna help people. The world would just be a lot better with you in it. <laughs> and, and I just, but by the end of me talking to the camera, I had convinced myself not to kill myself. Sometimes, even if there's not a physical person in the room, just talking, just talking out your feelings, just, just uh, fixes any bad feeling that you were feeling. Because I realized just how temporary that feeling of sadness was, that it was just a drop in the bucket of my whole life. This was a moment. And I was going to get through that moment because I'm an incredibly strong person and I've survived every bad day that I've ever gone through and I've gone through so many bad days. There's so much shit that's happened to me and I'm still here. And I'm going to get through this. This feeling of being scared, it's already passing. I can feel it. <laughs> the closer I get to Monday, the closer I get, I feel the anxiety being replaced with such a fucking bliss, such an amazing feeling of joy, and it fucking rules that I get to share that with you. So even though you, as a collective, <laughs> um, aren't here physically, I feel you here with me, and you give me strength. I know it's cheesy as fuck, but like, you know, I get, I get people contacting me all the time saying that I give them hope, but honestly, y'all do, you do that for me. You've helped me in ways that you'll never know. So I'm glad that I can return the favor. When I succeed, I feel like all of us are succeeding. And maybe that's why I take it so hard when I fail, because I feel like I'm failing you. But that's not true. The only real failure is when I don't try at all. And that's what this is. You know, the only, no matter what happens with surgery, the only way I can fail is if I don't try, if I just walk out now and, and I uh, just wonder the rest of my life what I could have had. I'm ready to fucking fly. <laughs> Do you guys want to know something really sad? Um, I'm here alone in a hotel in Austin for Thanksgiving, and I keep getting sad because I look over and see my little case, and it's the same shape and size of my cat. So I just keep looking over and thinking, my cat is here! <laughs> and then getting so sad that she's not. It's so funny. It's so fucking funny. It's the exact same shape of her just loafed. Anyway, hope you had a good day. <laughs> Ooh, I just got done running for the second time since transition. And I feel so fucking good. If you've been keeping up with these, you know what it is. But uh, if, if you're new here, I was a varsity cross country runner from seventh grade until senior year of high school. And I stopped because my body felt too bad. Um, I think I ran maybe a couple of years after high school, uh, after I graduated, but like, I just had no motivation. Something felt wrong and I didn't have the words for it. And now I, I look back and I'm like, oh, dysphoria, yes. And a lot of transition, uh, physical transition, and, and mental transition also, um, is just realizing that you actually love things uh, that you thought you hated. This is my day in between my workouts, and so I, I had told myself, like, I would love to, like, just do some running just so I have this in-between state, <laughs> you know, from, like, in the Pokemon Evolutions. The first, uh, you know, stage was, like, pre-transition running, Jesse, where I hadn't had top surgery yet, and I felt shitty. Um, and now I'm in this, this all waiting for the next stage where I've had top surgery but not bottom surgery. So... I want to do as much running as possible so that I know what it feels like um, before I have something knocking around my pants and that I have to deal with. And I have come to a discovery. So I was running and it felt incredible. Like I ran one time before this and it was, it was like maybe a mile, a mile and a half. I just uh, 
you know, went running around, and then I, I uh, stopped because I met up with a friend, and then we decided to hang out, so I didn't finish the run. I just got my, got my feet wet a little bit, uh, got back into the rhythm, and it, I felt so fucking good. Like, I had, this is an activity that I had done consistently for years and years, and I finally got to do it again as my true self, and like, fuck, it, I felt amazing. And I just went running again on the treadmill that they have here at the hotel, and I felt so incredible. I cannot describe to you what it, I just, I felt so fucking good. And I found myself smiling, like I was listening to music and running, and I just had this grin on my face that I, that was just naturally happening, and I never smiled while running before. It was always an activity that I did because I was good at it. Um, naturally, I just have a, a skill for it, and so I made varsity, and I didn't really want to run anymore, but I liked the endorphins, and they also bribed me with baked goods, so I continued to come back. And now it's this activity that, like, you know, I'm so happy, I'm so glad that it feels so good now. I didn't even know how long I had run, and then I looked down, and I wrote it down, because I was like, what the fuck? I had run 4.58 miles. Easy as cake. Fucking... What the fuck? Easy as cake. That's a saying now. Easy as pie is what I was gonna say. I combined easy as pie with piece of cake. It's easy as cake. Yeah, I almost ran five miles accidentally, and I just felt so good, and I, and I just kept going. It was like, it was so incredible. And this discovery that I have come to is the same one that I came to when I thought about my arm. Because before I was like, I want to appreciate being able to feel my arm now, because I might not be able to, um, you know, uh, later after surgery. And I haven't been able to appreciate it, uh, not because I don't appreciate it, but more, uh, what's the word? It's just not my arm, if that makes sense. I'm, mentally I know that this isn't, like, there are parts of my body that are not the true final form. <laughs> this isn't even my final form. So I haven't been able to, like, absorb it. I'm just kind of ready. I'm at peace and I'm ready to just... You know, I'm like, this is cool, but I know it's not going to look like this in a week, so let's just get that done, because I'm, I'm ready to take the steps, and I'm ready to just start the healing process, and I'm ready to see what my arm is supposed to look like. And that is the same thing that I have realized with running, is that, like, it feels so good to be able to run, like, top-wise, I'm like, fuck, I feel so fucking good, I'm running shirtless, this feels amazing. Both times I ran um, shirtless that I've run post-transition. And... I was, you know, it felt great at first that there was nothing knocking around in my pants because I'm used to just everything being dysphoric. Uh, I'm used to be just, just, I'm used to just being a mess when I'm running. So it felt really good. And then, like half an hour in, I realized I feel like something is supposed to be knocking around. So now I'm mentally ready for that too. I'm like, hey, this is great, but I know that I'm gonna have to deal with something knocking around, and it would actually kind of feel good for something to be knocking around because it feels like I'm supposed to have something there. I'm supposed to be dealing with something. So, same conclusion there. I'm, I'm ready for the next step. I work out tomorrow, so I might also do another run on Saturday. We'll see. Might as well get that energy out before I poop all my guts out. Might as well get all that energy out before I shit consistently for like 24 hours? I don't know. And also, this is something that I haven't talked to you about, but the me seeing my true self like, you know, parts of me, um, that also applies to when I look in the mirror and I see myself naked. And it's interesting because I never thought about how others might see me. Um, but, and there's a reason for that. I don't suffer from a lot of bottom dysphoria in the traditional sense of, like, I can't look in the mirror at myself because I don't really see that as myself. I, I you know, when I look at my bottom area when I'm naked right now, it doesn't really connect to me, it doesn't seem, it do, it's not a part of my body, so I don't feel dysphoria from it. And that's interesting, because, you know, a lot of trans men do feel dysphoria from that, but I, I think that's why I am comfortable and I, I'm not, like, super, super desperate to get phalloplasty. I'm very excited, and it's, it's definitely what I need, and it's what I want, but I'm not, like, in pain like I was with top surgery, where I needed it to be done, like, as soon as possible, because I was just so fucking sad all the time. With bottom, it's more like, I know that's not me, so I don't really feel dysphoria from it. And I also, you know, I don't feel... The only places that I feel a little bit of bottom dysphoria from is, is you know, during sex. But it's only from myself. Because every 
sex partner that I have had uh, since transition, uh, and especially since my, my face and my, the other parts of my body have been changing to look like my actual self, they, they just see me as a guy. Like, there are... It's so interesting what a mental thing that, that is. It's so fascinating to me because there are cis women and cis men and trans women that I've been with that forget that I'm trans, even though we've had sex. Like, they just fully see me as male. And that's such an interesting thing to me, you know? Because I, I've never slept with a trans man. I don't know how I would react to, to seeing, you know, the, the parts and everything not uh, matching up with what culturally I believe a man to be. And yet when people see me, they're in, you know, in a sexual situation or in a romantic situation, they just see a guy. They just see Jesse. There's no, um, there's no disconnect. And they, they, some of them have, in conversation, forgotten that I'm trans. And that's why transphobes don't have any power over me anymore, is because it's literally just because they know that I'm trans that they're being transphobic. When I go out in the world and I exist in public spaces, I am gendered correctly, I am legally, physically, mentally, everything male. Like, I'm just kind of, I just get to exist. And that's part of the reason I talked earlier about how I feel like a fake trans person sometimes. Um, because I don't have to deal with discrimination and stuff to the level that other trans people do. But that's why when a transphobe like calls me a girl or tries to guess my dead name, which is not, it's, they're too stupid to know what a dead name is and they keep calling me Jessica thinking it's gonna bother me even though I stopped using that name at five years old so I have no memory of it connected to me in any way. That's a whole thing I could get on. Um, if you, if you don't know, a dead name is not necessarily the name you were born with. It's, it, there's a, I can go into it. It's, <laughs> They're stupid, is the, is the thing. <laughs> they keep throwing everything at the wall hoping something will stick, and so you see how pathetic they are, and you can't be intimidated by someone like that. They've ruined it, you know? If all of their things were like 100% bullseyes, then I would be really hurt and traumatized. And in the beginning, when I was not, um, when I hadn't started tea or anything like that, I was affected by transphobes. But now I'm far enough into my transition that like, Literally nothing they say or do can hurt me at all, which is why trans men uh, tend to leave the internet, is because it's literally the only place that they can feel bad about being trans, because, like, you know, they pass. They, like, they go outside, they live their life, they live in small towns or they live in cities, and they just get to, like, fucking exist. So if you have one source where people are being an asshole to you, you're like, oh, okay, bye-bye. And then they just go and have happy lives, and that's why we don't really hear from them again, is because they're off being happy. And I'm fortunate enough that I can do both. I can exist on the internet, uh, and I'm confident and happy enough that, like, transphobes don't bother me. You just block them and move on. Some people are affected by that, and that's totally valid, you know? Um, but for me, they've just... It, they've made a fool of themselves too much, and, and so it doesn't really affect me anymore. Because you also have to see what else they're saying about other people. Uh, you can feel bad if someone's like, if you're trans and someone's like, I don't like trans people, and you're like, oh, my feelings are hurt. But then you like see what their opinion on other things are, and you're like, oh, this person is an idiot. <laughs> like, they're also like, you know, uh, if they're, they're being racist. If you go on a transphobe's Twitter, for example, all of their other tweets are just garbage. They're saying bad shit about trans people or harassing them, and then they're also like using the F slur, and they're also like picking on black people, and you and they, like, you know, they don't like women. It's all these things that stack up where if it was just affecting me, if someone was just being mean to me and everything else about them was perfect, I'd be like, oh, there's a problem with me. But when you see what their other opinions are and their other, like, they're in flat earth groups and like, it, there's, all, there's so much stupidity in that group specifically. Um, you know, they're 99% they're of the time they turn out to be Nazis. And so you look on their stuff and you're like, oh, this is just a bad person. Uh, and for me that, you know, saved me. I think if I hadn't realized that, I would still be affected by stuff like that. And fortunately I'm not, so I'm able to stay on the internet and, uh, and also be here in life, existing, being happy, living moss. Today was Thanksgiving, my friend uh, Andrew brought me a plate because uh, he was making Thanksgiving dinner, and so I have some lovely uh, turkey and mac and cheese and mashed potatoes and crescent rolls. And it fucking rules. Uh, he brought me a can of Baja Blast also, so I will have to try that again. I haven't tried Baja Blast in... Uh
fucking long ass time. This was my first Thanksgiving alone, and I feel great, you know? I've talked at length about how I don't like Thanksgiving. I don't, there's not, you can't decolonize Thanksgiving. There's no way for me to like eat turkey and celebrate on a day that everyone else is like, it's not, it doesn't feel good. But Friendsgiving is what I wanted. I want what Thanksgiving represents. I want a fall harvest meal where we can get together and eat some pie and be thankful for our friends and our family. And I got that. I did not have to deal with my stepfather for the first time at uh, Thanksgiving. And I got to hang with people that I give a shit about and it was really fun. So I wasn't planning on doing anything special today, so it was nice that I got some food. I feel very good. I can't, I'm, I'm still just so, I'm, I'm blown away that I really enjoyed this activity that I used to do for so long and then didn't, didn't like anymore because of my body. I didn't know I could enjoy running this much. And I'm a little disappointed that like I'm about to get surgery and not be able to run for a while. But once I run again, oh boy, I'm gonna have to deal with a dogger. I'm not sure what's gonna happen with that because I, I don't think they make jock straps that are big enough for me. So we'll see, we will see. We watched the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire uh, because it is technically a Thanksgiving movie. Uh, and I, I ate turkey while watching that movie, which I've never done before. So like the Thanksgiving scene happened and the Macy's Day Parade scene happened. That movie is so iconic for so many reasons. And there's so many memes. There's so many memes, like Kirsten Dunn's turning around and like yelling. And you know, I'm a bit, what, you know, some would say I'm a bit of a scientist myself or whatever the fuck the, you know, I'm quite a, oh, what the fuck is the line? You know the meme. You're the one who's out, Gobby, out of your mind. I, it, there's so many iconic fucking, it's such an iconic movie. But from that, I realized that my earbuds connecting to my tablet, uh, they just kept disconnecting in a way where I could hear what was going on and we were streaming the movie, but my mic wasn't working. And so I had to keep connecting and disconnecting it, no matter what headphones I, I plugged into it. I even had, like, I had manual headphones that I physically plugged into the tablet and that wasn't working. And apparently that's just a thing with tablets because my friend's AirPods, uh, they also, they were like, oh yeah, that happens sometimes with my AirPods. So I don't think I'm gonna plan to uh, discord with anyone in the hospital and I'm gonna download some stuff to watch. I wanna show my mom Tick Tick Boom uh, when she's here, so I will refrain from that. I don't want to get sick of it. I watched it again last night, and I cried a lot. <laughs> Today is a day that I want to be thankful for things, even though the holiday sucks. I try to turn it into something positive, and I try to just take it as an opportunity to just focus on the things that I'm thankful for, and I'm so thankful that I get to do this. I have a fucking dream job where I get to entertain people for a living, and Although it's intimidating sometimes, people get to see me doing my thing, and it means a lot to them. I got a message the other day from a trans person on Instagram, and they were like, Hey, I just want to thank you for like being so fearless. I, I, did, I thought you were just a cis guy, um, because I, I just know you, I knew you from TFS at the table, um, and I didn't know you weren't uh, until the last episode where you, um, I wore uh, the TFS logo, Trans Pride shirt. Um, and they, they, they had a heart to heart with me and were like, like, this means a lot to me. And, and I realized it does, it does mean a lot. Representation fucking matters, even though it's like a, a phrase that's been done into the ground, it's because it's important. And I keep remembering that I needed someone like me when I was a kid. So it's really important. But also on a side note, I'm glad that I'm, st I'm crying more. I love that because it was... It was tough not being able to cry for a bit. And, and if I'm uh, connecting to a character, I'm able to produce tears. And I like that, that's good. And as an actor, that's all I really need. As long as I can just like connect to a character, then it won't be good. Anyway, I think that's all for now. I'm gonna go snack on some more turkey. Oh, also I forgot to say, I got my COVID test today and it was the chillest fucking experience ever because you're supposed to pull into the emergency lot, basically, um, of the hospital, and then they come out to the car and do it for you. And we pull up and there's no number posted, there's no nothing like they said there would be. So I was like, I'm just gonna go in, I'm gonna pop inside. So I wander inside and, you know, no one's there because it's Thanksgiving. 
Like, they signed me up, I signed up for the COVID test on Thanksgiving, but I, I didn't realize how chill it was going to be. So I look behind the glass and someone's like, um, oh, well, I look behind the glass and there's someone there. And I say, hi, I'm here for a COVID test. And she goes, two o'clock, right? What's your name? And I say, you know, Jesse Nowak. And that's so funny. And, and I, I don't think about it until a minute later because she asks me for my ID and my insurance card. Uh, and she asks me to sit down and that, and that um, when she's done scanning uh, those and getting a copy of them, she'll come out and give me some paperwork to sign. And I sit down and I hear her say, only one we've got today. And I realize in that moment, oh, I'm the only weird person that signed up to get a COVID test on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, of course she knows what time my COVID test is at. I'm literally the only person that day. Yeah, it was super fucking chill. I signed paperwork. She gave me a red pen. That's how fucking chill the mood was. Like, the vibes were very, very good. Um, I just signed my paperwork in red pen. And I like that, you know? Because it, it looks it looks more fun. Give me a purple pen. Give me a blue pen. Let's, let's fuck this up. And when she comes out to give me the test, she's like, have you ever done one of these before? And I say no. And she's like, it's gonna, it's gonna burn a little bit. Um, but it's only gonna be in there a short second. And I'm like, okay. And then she puts a Q-tip in my nostril and it's far up there. Like I saw uh, Andrew, my friend that drove me there. Actually, I was with him the previous day when he got a COVID test. Um, and it was a self-test that we did at a CVS. And I heard the person give him instructions and I was like, oh cool, this is like, to, it's good for me to see what it might be like. And she says, you're gonna take the Q-tip and insert it in each of your nostrils um, for a, an inch up and do that for like 15 seconds. And so he does it, wasn't that bad, you know, it feels weird, but whatever. Um, but when, you, when this nurse did it, she sticks it up there pretty far, but it's literally for only like three to four seconds each nostril. So shorter amount of time, but farther up. And it, 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 it's a blast. I would say <laughs> like, it, it's a, it's a blast. It's a great time. Uh, I mean, it's a blast of pain, like just uncomfortability, I guess I would say. It just feels ugh. like the way she described it was that you're going to feel like you need to sneeze. That wasn't what it was for me. It just felt like something is up there. Like, you know, when something is up in your nose. When I was a kid, I got sponges stuck up in my nose. Uh, it was the, the, if you've seen the Mommy and Me videos, I think they're private now, but the, it's a series that I did with my mom where we went through stories about when I was little. Um, and I had to go to the hospital to get the sponges taken out of my nose. And I remembered that in that moment. But it's so funny because I felt bad because when it was done and she took it out, I couldn't help it. I went, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> like, I just, I couldn't help it. It was like, oh, fuck. That's like, that's, I don't know. It just, you feel, it's a, it's a, I think it's just because the feeling is so unfamiliar that there is something here where inside your body that has not, you're not used to that being there. And she was like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, it's, you're doing your job. I'm, I'm fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then it was over. And she was like, no news is good news. So if you don't hear from us, uh, just show up for your surgery because you're all good. When we were on the highway, we saw a sign that was lit up that said, Turkey goes buckle buckle. And I haven't stopped thinking about it. And the other thing that it said was raising your gobblet. And it, it, and it took me a second. I, I, I didn't understand it. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And Andrew was like, it was like a goblet. Cause it's like a, like an alcohol, like don't drink and drive. And I'm like, that one's fucking stupid. <laughs> like, like goblet, you are forcing a pun. As a queer person, this makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> but Turkey says buckle buckle. That fucking rules. That is just the right level of absurd and fucking stupid that I'm like, I'm all for it. Yes. Turkey says buckle buckle. Oh god. Oh, also when I was signing all my paperwork and I got done and I gave it to another person behind the glass, it was a guy, and he was like, all set, partner? And for some reason that I love that so much. I'm going to adopt partner into my vernacular because I've, I've forgotten that I'm in Texas and that's very good. Partner is also gender neutral. So let's, let's fucking do it, partner. <sighs> I love hotels. I don't know if I've ever talked about that. We've talked about so much and I don't know if I've actually talked about how much I love hotels. I don't know what it is. And that probably says something about me that I, that I like hotels, that I, I love this like 
this temporary residence that you get to make your home for a little bit. I don't know, every time I get to travel for conventions and stuff, this is like one of my favorite parts. I don't know what it is. I've never felt like any place has been a home for me. I don't, I don't feel a kinship with any particular state or city. So maybe I just like moving around. I, I, <laughs> I, I understand why writers sometimes go to hotels to write. Because it really just, getting away from home, or wherever you consider home, wherever you live, you know, um, gives you this freeing feeling of like a refresh. Like a, I don't know, this feels like a nice little place to spend some time and then I can move on to the next one. And I'm, I'm feeling excited about staying in the, ho the, the hospital as well. <laughs> um, the hospital, I was gonna combine hotel and hospital just now. Um, and I just connected those things, where I'm excited to stay in the hospital for the small amount of time that I'll be there. I think any more than five or six days, I would be like, going a little stir crazy, but it's just the right amount of time to get away from the stagnant home that I consider Texas. <laughs> well, I'm still in Texas. Dallas. Um, yeah. Austin is a place where I can just be for a bit, and I'll be happy being in the hotel for uh, the, the, the other one that I go to after the hospital. I'll be happy going there for, for three weeks or so, and uh, feels good. Yeah, I thought I'd just talk about that because I don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever brought it up. I know that I just talked about Tick Tick Boom, I think, in yesterday's episode, and unfortunately Steven Sondheim passed away today or rather, a couple hours ago today. Um, it's technically the next day, it's technically Saturday. He passed away on Friday, and... What a fucking legend, man, like, what the fuck? <sighs> he lived to like 91, that's crazy. That's, that's, I'm so glad we got so much time with him. And I'm so glad that Tick Tick Boom came out and he was able to see it, and he actually was in it for a brief moment. Um, I forget the name of the actor who plays Sodheim in Tick, Tick, Boom, but the uh, spoilers for Tick, Tick, Boom, I'm about to say some spoilers, and if you haven't seen it, go watch it, it's great. Um, the voicemail that Jonathan gets at, near the end of the movie, uh, after the workshop is done, is actually Stephen Sodheim's voice, um, and that's really cool. They, they got him in for it, and yeah, you know, the... The release, the press release article thing that I read about it was um, a friend of his was like, he, he described his death as sudden, like seemingly out of nowhere. Because, I mean, think about what, what was happening. Like the day just the night before he was having Thanksgiving dinner with friends and family. And now he's gone. And just to, you fucking changed the game. And I'm, I'm so grateful for everything that he, he gave us. And again, it's another reminder that, like, life is precious. Like, yeah, he lived in 91, but, like, no one really saw his death coming. It just kind of happened. And we just got to appreciate shit while we have it. I heard the news about him, and then I went to do my last workout. Uh, my last weightlifting workout, I should say. Tomorrow I'm going to try to do another five mile run. We'll see how that goes. Um, but tonight was my last weightlifting. <laughs> really just focused on all the muscle groups, tried to focus on my left arm. And I had a thought occur to me while I was working out, thinking about Sodheim and thinking about Jonathan Larson and thinking about Tick Tick Boom and how it was like, the it's really is the perfect thing to come out right before my surgery because there's so many parallels to my own life and so many there's so much that I needed to hear. And the song that I keep listening to over and over is Come to Your Senses. Um, I'm just gonna be talking about spoilers for Tick Tick Boom, so you might as well, you gotta pause this and go watch it if you're gonna continue watching this video. Sodheim, you remember the character, you know, like, and the person. I'm sure it's based on true event stuff. Um, he hears Superbia, and he says there, there needs to be a song here, and he talks about how your protagonist has come to a fork in the road, Someone needs to come and wake him up. 
And so this character sings this song, waking him up, snapping him out of it, and being like, you know, you come to your senses, the, the, the name of the song. And that's kind of what I needed right now. I, I'm nervous still for this surgery that's coming up in a, in a few days. And I know in my heart that everything's gonna go well, and I know, you know, you just, ever since I was a kid, I've known that I've been destined for great things. I've been chosen to affect the world in some way, and I hope it's in a positive way. I, I, all of a sudden the song was singing to me. All of a sudden, I realized I need to fucking snap out of it. I need to fucking just accept that I'm about to get everything I've ever wanted. And I realized what I needed to say to myself. I realized what needed to happen because I live for myself like 99% of the time. I am confident and happy and I love myself and I want to do what's best for myself. But my real weakness is that I can't accept positive criticism and that I, you know, it's the double negative light, not the double negative, it's the double-edged sword where, yeah, I can't uh, accept negative, you know, shit talking and all that, and that's great, but I also can't accept positive stuff. And the real way to get to me is for me to do something for other people, for the people who need it. That is my one weakness, you know? Or strength, when you think about it, is that sometimes I can't do things for myself. And when that happens, someone will come along and I'll be like, oh, this person needs me to do it for them. It's the thing I was talking about before, you know? Uh, I need syrup for my pancakes, but I won't ask for it. But if my friend needs syrup, I will ask for it. And it's not a great way to, to live in general, where if you're just living for other people, but I'm at the point where surgery is a few days away and I've exhausted, and when, you, when I've exhausted all my other options, now I'm at a point where it's like, okay, if you can't do it for yourself, do it for other people. You want to make such a big deal out of this surgery going well, you're like, oh, well, I represent all trans men, so if this surgery doesn't go well, then I'm letting everyone down and people are going to think bad things about this particular surgery just because of me. Okay, well, do something about it. Succeed because you don't have a choice. This surgery has to go well. So mentally put it in your head that it's gonna go well. <laughs> you know? If I can't accept that it's gonna go well for myself, then accept it for other people. You have to succeed, you don't have a choice. And all of a sudden everything made sense. And I was like, okay. And something just clicked into place. And now, instead of being 50% anxious, 50% excited. Now the percentage is slowly going upwards in my favor. <laughs> I will do it for you. I will succeed because we have to succeed. And just like that, the universe gives me little bumps in the right direction, little nudges when I need it, because I just got a lovely comment on Twitter that I'd like to share. Hey Jesse, I just binge watched your Pink Blue episodes 20 through 26. That was a Friday evening event, well worth it. I wish you the best of luck in the next big chapter of your life. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. I believe your content has prepared me to be a better ally. I really think you should know that you're making the world a better place. Besides all that, listening to your videos for hours was fun and companionable. It's great you found friends who appreciate you and love you. So thank you to the person who sent me that. And I also got a, a lovely comment on Instagram. I briefly mentioned my poetry book, Raw, that I think came out in like 2016 or 2017. It was a long ass time ago. But someone uh, commented on the post and said, Raw was an amazing piece of art. I still read it when times are tough. And that just like, I, I read all of the nice comments that y'all give me, but it's really tough for me to like accept you know, g good, <laughs> good words. And right now I really needed them, so thank you. Like I've said before, a, a lot of you say that I inspire you, but honestly, you inspire me right back. Like, I, I really needed to hear that. I needed to hear all of it. <laughs> Sometimes you just need someone to come wake you up. I brought some pre-made chocolate protein shakes here to, to have after my workouts. And I've been mixing that with the pumpkin spice milk, and oh my god, what a good idea. Very good. Uh, I'm 
glad I've, I've been enjoying those. And it is three nights before my surgery, so I have started washing it with the pain soap. Get it everywhere below your neck, it's very important, but if you get it above your neck, you will die certain death. I just think of that quote from Iroh, you know, where he's like looking at the, the flower and he's like, delicious tea? or deadly poison. I remembered how nervous I am washing with it, not because of the, the maybe blindness and maybe deafness that you would receive if you got it above your uh, face, but also just the fact that it doesn't bubble, it doesn't act like proper soap. So they say to put it on a wet washcloth, turn off your shower, like you do all the soapy, regular soapy stuff first. Like if you do your regular soap after the pain soap, it will negate the effects. So you do your regular soap, your regular shampoo, whatever, uh, wash it off, you put a, you get a wet washcloth, you put the pain soap on it, and then you turn off the water. And they say to wash the area that the surgery is going to happen first, then get everything else below the neck. But the problem is it's not sudsy, it's not soapy. So like I put it on the washcloth and then started washing and it's, it looked like nothing was happening, which made me nervous. But the surgery instructions for stage zero told me on the paper, there, it, this soap isn't gonna get soapy. But these directions for stage one did not warn me about the soap. So I feel bad if someone goes directly to like these instructions and, and are just squeezing more and more soap on the fucking thing, being like, why isn't it working? The soap isn't being soap. Am I doing something wrong? Am I gonna fuck up my surgery? So just to be sure, just to be absolutely sure, I did the washcloth, I scrubbed the areas that I'm supposed to have surgery on first, my arm. Um, I'm not sure which leg they're taking the skin graft that's gonna go on the arm. So I just did both. And then the, the, genital area, which is very against- my brain was screaming the whole time. If you're not someone who has any junk, um, you're not supposed to use soap on any junk. Uh, it is a self-cleaning, self-washing organ, so you can actually hurt yourself by using soap on it. So the whole time I'm using this soap that also doesn't look like soap, but it's not acting like soap, and I'm scrubbing the genital area, and I'm like, ah, uh, no! I'm gonna get a UTI, I'm gonna fucking die. And I almost chickened out a few times, but the instructions say, do it on the surgical sites, and that's where I'm getting surgery. And no one told me not to. So I have to, right? Anyway, I put the soap on the washcloth, I washed the surgery zones first, then I did everything else below the neck. And you're supposed to leave that on for two minutes with no water running on you, so I did. But then I still felt weird. I felt like nothing was happening. So I also, after that, I took- and, and I'm- I don't know if this is proper. This is just me sharing my experience with you. I don't know if you're supposed to do this, but it seems- it seemed correct to me. And I also did this last time, uh, for stage zero, and I didn't tell you about it. After two minutes were up, just to be safe, I took some of the pain soap, put on my hands, washi washi would uh, scrubbed, again, the, the the surgery areas, and then did everything else. Uh, and and that, you you can tangibly feel the, and, and see the soap better. Before, when I put the soap on the washcloth on my arm, it just didn't look like anything. But when I put the soap on my hands and rub it on there, you can see the, the clearish white foam, basically, where, where it, uh, it's like, hey, you don't have enough water on this, and I'm like, haha, good, I want to see the soap. And then I left that on for two minutes. So in total, I've done like four minutes, and uh, it didn't burn or anything, so we good. But now I'm also a bit nervous, because, like, the instructions, I feel like most of these instructions are for the day of surgery, like the morning of surgery, because it says, dry your skin with a freshly washed towel, put on freshly washed clothes, don't put any lotions, perfumes, powders, or deodorant on your skin the day of surgery. See, now, I don't know if they just... What counts for what? Because now, I don't know if I'm allowed to put lotion on or... You know, like, uh, things above face... The, my face, I can put uh, acne cream and stuff on. I'm, pr I'm pretty certain of that. But everything below, I don't know. Can I put my after shower spritz on? Can I put uh, Copenhagen grooming on my chest? What am, what are the what can I do? Because I've been putting lotion on my arm, two different lotions, one that's um, perfume and scent free uh, to just get a get a nice moisturizing coat on, and then uh, one that would be good for the rosacea. I don't know what it is. I'm putting two lotions on, and I to make sure my arm is in tip top condition for surgery. So am I allowed to do that now, or is that just for morning of surgery? Because again, stage zero surgery on their sheets, they said wash uh, with, the with the pain soap the night before and the morning of surgery. So they didn't do three days in advance. 
and they specified morning of surgery, don't put any lotions or whatever. So actually, I think I'm answering my own question. I think I'm okay to put lotions and shit on now, the three nights of the surgery stuff. But the morning of surgery, when I do the shower again, I should not put any kind of lotions or anything on. And this is me, again, not being a doctor, not knowing what's proper. I'm just letting you know what I'm doing right now. We're walking through the thought process together. Remember I was talking about sometimes you just need to talk to a camera, talk to a journal, talk to an inanimate object if you do not have a friend to talk to, and we're problem solving together. So I'm going to put on my lotions and shit, and we'll see what's up. You know, I've just made myself dinner. And I was just thinking about what I just talked to you about in the last vlog, and I realized that I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't because you're a camera, um, I don't believe I've talked to you about why it is that I keep feeling like something's going to go wrong, what the bigger issue is, the bigger cause of why that's happening. I think I've only talked to you about, yeah, I think I just, I can't accept good things and I'm afraid something bad's gonna happen all, always by default. I don't think I've ever told you why, and if I have, bear with me. I'm sure I'd explain it differently at different points in my life, but right now, sitting on this bed two days before surgery, I will tell you that the, the bigger issue, the bigger reason why I think something bad is gonna happen by default in a lot of cases is because of the trauma of losing all of the people that I did when I transitioned. And I say losing, you know, I did but it was for the best, I know that now. But at the time, it was really traumatic. When I came out, there was a lot of, you know, just transphobic people that just don't like trans people and don't want to be friends with trans people. But there were also people that it, it was more subtle with. And the combination of those people made it so that I steeled myself and I was like, I'm, I'm scared. And in a state of pessimism, every time that I go on social media, which is so interesting because I have evolved to a point where I don't care what other people think about me, but the trauma is still there. So when I first transitioned, I would feel bad if, uh, if someone said something transphobic to me, and now I don't feel bad at all because I'm so secure in myself. But the history is still there, the trauma is still there. I talked a bit before about how I assume something that someone's gonna say to me is gonna be bad by default, so then I'm prepared for it, and that's why I don't feel anything when it turns out to be bad. But that's so, that's so few instances nowadays. A lot of the interactions that I have online are very, very positive. And because I assume that it's bad by default, I can't absorb a good thing when it is said to me. And that is translated to every aspect of my life because I lived with that trauma for so long. For so long, it was the default that because I kept bad people in my life and I thought I could change them and it turned out that I couldn't. They were just gonna be bad and I cut them out of my life. But for, the, the t uh, for a period of time, I kept them in my life. So there's a lot of, ah, feeling. I've noticed it especially while driving. Uh, I don't drive anymore, it get, I'm too anxious to, and that was like pre-transition. Um, I, I stopped driving because I was too anxious about it. And when I'm in a passenger seat or in the back seat, no matter where I am in the car, when I'm driving with people, I found a lot of intrusive thoughts just happen. At least once every car ride, I will picture us crashing. I will picture us getting in an accident and me getting injured or my friends getting injured or whoever is driving the car. I picture a horrible wreck. And I kept being like, oh, that's silly. Don't picture that. That's an intrusive thought. You know, because you everyone has intrusive thoughts and you push them away. Everyone is walking at the mall and then sees the railing. It's like, what would happen if I just jumped over this thing? Like, we all, we all have intrusive thoughts where it's like, oh, there's a baby. What if I kicked that baby? We're not going to do those things. They're just intrusive thoughts. It's how psychology works. It's how the brain works. We, we all have them. And it doesn't make you a bad person. Good people and bad people. That's kind of black and white, but like, good people and bad people, we all have them. And I've realized what the bigger issue is, the more that that kept happening, the more I couldn't push it away. And it's because of the same thing, it's because of the same trauma. I am stealing myself and assuming something bad will happen so that I don't get hurt, but it's happening with everything now. And I can kind of track my progress with it by what happens when I'm in a car. <laughs> Nowadays, I've been trying to push that feeling aside and so I have more good experiences with, with vehicles than bad. Sometimes I can go a whole car ride without picturing something bad happening. But that's what's happening right now with the surgery. All of the factors are in my favor. I don't smoke, I work out, I'm in really good shape, I'm young, I have insurance, I have the best care, like, 
in the fucking country uh, for this specific surgery. Well, I have the top surgeons. They do this a million fucking times a year. There's no reason that I should be assuming the worst case scenario, and yet I am. And it is solely because of that trauma. If I had not experienced that trauma, I would be not picturing these intrusive thoughts. And so that's the reason. I think I've talked about this trauma in the past, but I haven't specifically told you why, how it's connected to this surgery. So yeah, logically, I know nothing bad is going to happen. It's very unlikely that something bad would happen. So why can't I just accept it? Why can't I just accept that I'm happy and that I'm gonna get something truly amazing that I've, I've wanted my entire life? So that's what we're working on right now. Uh, spoilers for Midnight Gospel. I'm, I'm just doing a lot of media. I connect a lot to media. Sometimes things pop up right when I need to hear them. I'll be vague just in case, but there's someone that comes to the AA meeting with Riley and one character is like, you have been here before he has. You know, you've been coming here for weeks. You were closed off at first and now you're way more talkative. You have something that you can say to this guy that I can't. And so Riley thinks about it and then he says, you showed up. That's enough. And I was like, fuck. Yeah. It's enough. It's enough if I just show up for my surgery. Because whether I like it or not, the surgery is gonna go really well. Whether I acknowledge it or not, the surgery is gonna go really well and I'm gonna get everything I wanted. And that's just what's going to happen. I'm the only one standing in my way. Oh man, another spoiler for Midnight Gospel. The scene in the trailer home, a character comes to another character, says that she forgives him, uh, and she's like, if I can forgive you, you can forgive yourself. The only person standing in my way is me. The only person standing in my way is me! It's me. I'm the problem. I need to just shut the fuck up and enjoy life. Trauma is a piece of shit. PTSD is a piece of shit. It affects the way you see reality. But I've gotten through so much bad shit. I've gotten through so much. If I could get through all that shit, of course I can go get through this very easy scenario, easy in that the first part. The first part, just all I have to do is just be unconscious and just let a surgery happen. I don't have to like do anything active except believe in myself. The mind is a powerful thing. If I go into that surgery believing something bad's gonna happen, something might. But if I go into the surgery thinking something good is going to happen, I give myself the best chance. It really is, because it's like, you know, I'm not talking about the secret or shit like that. But, like, there are true elements to positive thinking. I have to be in the best state of mind possible when I go into that surgery. And you know what? I will. I'm the only person standing in my way. I just need to show up. I refuse to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I refuse. I refuse. That's the silliest thing in the world. Let's fucking go in there and kick some ass. I'm gonna amp myself up. Like, I know that like the next two days are gonna be spent me doing work on myself and really focusing on positive thinking and being like, this shit is gonna fucking rock my world. And then I'm gonna show up to surgery the morning of and be like, let's fucking go, bud. Yeah, let's fucking go. Because I know how I am when I ran cross country. And I would start out the race, I would do 90% of the race just trying to keep pace or whatever. Then the last 10%, I fucking sprint. Because I was meant to be a sprinter, not a long distance runner. And I didn't use my full potential. I just used the last 10% and fucking wait. When it's go time, I show up. So that's exactly what's going to happen on surgery day. I'm very confident. I wonder if I'm gonna cry when I see my penis for the first time. I predict I'm gonna cry. Because I don't cry for myself. I, I only cry connecting to other people and other people's, you know, emotions. I'm an empath. I connect to characters. That's why I'm an actor. And there are very few things that I think I would cry about for myself. This is one of them. I think this is what's gonna get me. I haven't cried for myself in a long ass time. This is gonna be it. And you won't be able to see it, but I'll tell you about it. I'll do a narration thing. Because I'm gonna be on a lot of drugs and I'm not gonna be able to film myself. <laughs> it's go time. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. I'm about to talk about something maybe gross. Um, I'm gonna talk about smells. The musk, the, the trans male musk, that uh, I didn't understand what it meant. There's a, there's a lot of trans dudes that are like, yeah, the musk, like I just smell, I smell so good. And I assumed it was BO because that's like what a body smells like. I didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, but I've realized now the musk comes from, you know, your junk starting to smell like penis once you've uh, been on testosterone long enough. It's the change that happens in the downstairs area where your, your junk starts to smell like dick 
and uh, your cum tastes like semen. It tastes like male cum. And that's a lovely smell. I fucking love the smell of that. And I wonder if that'll come back. And I'm not talking about during the healing process. In the packet specifically, it says, what's that smell? You know, we went over it. It's going to smell bad uh, for a while while everything is healing. But afterwards, I wonder if the, if the musk will come back, and I believe it will. Because all that stuff is being turned into penis, and I wonder if the, if it's, if it's gonna, I think it eventually will. I think once skin is enough around that smell, it'll absorb it, and then I'll be able to smell it on the outside. I don't know. I hope this isn't too gross. I'm trying to track everything. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there because there's not a lot of guys who are able to, like, talk to a camera and discuss things that are going through our brains and happening to our bodies. Uh, there's a lot of trans dudes who aren't YouTubers and, and aren't, you know, I'm not a YouTuber. I don't, ugh, I don't count myself as that. But they're not known on the internet. They don't have the means to video edit and like produce stuff like I do. So here it is. I just fucking honest dick on the table. Let's talk about smells and cum. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the shit that I, I don't know if anyone else has. Because I didn't know this shit. I didn't know that my cum was gonna taste like semen. I, it's, I didn't know until like three different sexual partners told me. I didn't know I would grow an Adam's apple until my singing coach told me. I didn't know I'd be able to orgasm once I grew my tea dick until it happened. I didn't know I was gonna grow a tea dick. I didn't know that happens. And the tea dick is necessary to understanding how phalloplasty works because the nerves are all hooked up. But yeah, there's a lot that I didn't know and I, I'm glad, I'm, I'm happy that I get to share it with you. I was so gr I'm so grateful to my mom for taking care of me during this, but I did have to think about the fact that my mom is going to see a lot of me naked in the next three weeks. But then I was like, you know what? It's fine, because I, she raised me as a single mom uh, since I was a baby. She had to powder my ass and change my diapers and all that shit, and now, she gets to do it in my true form. We never got to have the weird cartoon instance where like a, a, a baby with a penis is being changed and then it pees on the person. They're like, oh no, trying to change the diaper. The wacky fucking sitcom situation. Uh, this, this, <laughs> I don't think that'll happen, but we, pee will be involved. And you know what? Good for her. I'm glad she gets to, to experience me as a baby in my real body. Whoever takes care of you during phalloplasty, it's going to, it's going to be a raw experience, whether it is a partner or a family member or a friend. Could be a friend. But yeah, no time for modesty. I'm just, I, we're just, it's going to be weird. And you know what? That, that shows how much they care. That shows how much whoever you choose cares about you, that they're willing to help you with the weird because this is so important to you. And I hope I won't get pee on as many services as I think I will. Life has been so much easier um, since I've accepted that I can wear sweatpants out in public. Oh wow, it felt good. Uh, we, we just went to a diner um, where I got my last meal before um, surgery, you know, like, meal, meal, tomorrow, or starting at 7 a.m., I'm going to be doing just liquids. And I realized I, it wasn't a thing that I did with stage zero surgery, but with my top surgery, uh, I know exactly what my last meal was because I had to stop eating at midnight. Uh, for top surgery, I did not have to do a bowel evacuation. Um, I just needed to like stop intake at midnight uh, before the surgery and uh, my my partner, well, my, my ex-partner and I um, now, the, at the time we were dating. I don't know how to say that. I made it awkward. Um, and our friend, <laughs> we went to this diner, and I, I remember my last meal was a waffle a la mode. It was a, it was a waffle that had a scoop of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry ice cream. And I took a picture of it, and I was like, and I, and I think I posted it on Instagram. And I realized that wasn't something that I did um, with stage zero, so I thought I would uh, pick it up again uh, with stage one, where we were sitting at the diner, and I was like, oh, I should take a picture of this. Um, so here it is, my last meal before surgery is uh, a patty melt and a pumpkin pancake, one singular pumpkin pancake. I brought them back with me, and I will be nibbling on them until 7 a.m., and then I will cast them outside so that I am not tempted. So I'm gonna take you on a journey. I'm gonna take you on a journey with these laxative things. Are you ready? In the previous video, you get to see my reaction live as I'm reading the laxative box and see that it is a suppository. And for some reason, I was thinking more about it and I was like, that doesn't, 
Something seems off. Because they already have me doing an enema. Are they really having me shove so much shit up my ass? So I went back and read the instructions again for the bowel evacuation, and it's all time-stamped, you know? At 7 a.m. you do this, at noon you do this. And it says, at noon, take four Dolcolax laxative tablets. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, that sounds like I'm taking tablets. It's, they say tablets, they, they use the word tablets. I don't think I'm supposed to be taking suppositories. So I read it again and realized, oh, Dolcolax also has tablets that you put in your mouth and not in your butt. So I resolved myself this morning to be like, okay, I will walk to Target and I'll do a little switcheroo. No one needs to know, it's fine. I'm not confessing to a crime on the internet, but also be gay and do crimes. So I switched out my suppository with the other tablets and I brought them home. And I was like, oh, thank God. And I also got the, the memory card while I was out. Then I get back here and I haven't slept yet. I get back here at about 1 p.m. and I hadn't slept yet. Um, I woke up the previous night at like 8 p.m. and then I just stayed up all night. Uh, and I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm up. I'll do some walking. So I am a little bit tired, but I would like to contribute this mostly to my himbo brain. Where I get back here, I lay down, and I'm like, okay. And I read it, and I'm like, okay, just to be sure. Just want to make sure, because they say how many milligrams. They say like a five milligram tablet, you take four of them. And I looked on my box, and it had 100 milligram tablets. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. And I realized what happened is that I saw this box. This is the proper one. Long story short, I had to go back for a third time. I was so tired that I was just like, I'm gonna sleep. And then um, I texted Andrew, I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so tired. Um, I walked to a, a Target and I'm very tired. Can you give me a lift? I need to do a switcheroo again. And he was like, yeah, no worries. So I slept and then we got up and did it. And the reason that I kept ignoring the box that I'm supposed to be getting is because it says overnight relief on it. So I was like, oh, I don't need that one. That's for like, if you want to take a, a pill and then like shit in the morning. But when I read down here, it says relief in six to 12 hours. That makes sense. The overnight, yeah, you don't have, to, it's not drowsy. It's not gonna make you drowsy or anything. You just, you need to take it and then it's gonna make you shit. And this is the fastest one because the, the first one that I got was a suppository. And then the second one that I got said there was relief in 12 to 72 hours. And it also was like a lot more. You got like 25 tablets in it. Actually, this one you have 25 tablets. I don't know. Point is I'm a dummy and we finally, finally got the right fucking laxatives. And I knew I had to take care of this shit tonight because 7 a.m. hits, I'm not leaving this hotel. I have Andrew on standby if I need more chicken broth or coconut water or some shit. But once the clock strikes 7 a.m., I have to just, I, I have to resolve myself that I am not leaving this hotel room. I'm going to be an on and off shitting water fountain for the next 24 hours. I was gonna go for a run tonight, but then I realized my legs are a little tired and it might, it's a combination of accidentally running five miles after not keeping up with running. I, I'm grateful that I have the, I, I'm in good shape. And this is probably, I'm in the best shape of my life. And I also have some muscles that I have retained from varsity cross country because I did run consistently so, so much for six years straight. So my legs look good. They, I, I don't do leg day and everyone always compliments my legs. And I've always been like, I, I don't do, I don't exercise them. I don't know why people think I have good legs. And I've realized looking at them like, oh, I have retained some muscle because I did work out just my legs basically like really, really intensely for six plus years, so it makes sense that, that I would still retain some muscle from that. So I accidentally ran five miles the other day, because I was just like so stoked, it was my second time running after top surgery. Yeah, I feel really good, I love running, this feels amazing. But I don't want to be completely exhausted when surgery starts, you know? Because if I go for a five mile run tonight, then tomorrow I'm shitting out all of my, all of my nutrients and my body's gonna be depleted and I might feel weak and then I go into surgery, I feel like that wouldn't be correct. So as much as I don't want to skip it, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna skip running tonight. I think it's more important that I take care of my health and be at my tip top condition. I feel a lot better about my penis today. Something that I remembered uh, when my mom went through colorectal cancer, one of the things that she really focused on was visualization. And you know, visualization is not some magic fucking cure where you can just control the universe, but it does have, I believe that it, it, it does have an effect on 
mental state and stuff because if you are visualizing that you can win you're you're visualizing that like something is possible then you're less nervous about it and you tend to be a happier person if you are constantly doing this and people are attracted to happy people so it's not like a magic cure-all but my life does drastically improve when I do practice positive thinking and shit like that like not a magic cure but people like happy people people like confident people so I remembered that uh, yesterday, my mom, it's a, a silly little thing that uh, she was like, this is going to sound silly, but when I had colorectal cancer, I pictured the Powerpuff Girls in my, in a, you know, like magic school bus style where the cancer is, and I'm picturing the Powerpuff Girls just beating up my cancer. And I was like, that's cute, mom. I love that. That's very, that's very cute. And I helped her get through it, you know, and she beat it. And I remember that, you know, Back when I ran cross country, that's something I would practice is like visualizing myself running the race and I feel great and everything's going well and I cross the finish line and I do it and I, I break records, I'm, I, I, personal records, you know, I'm not, I wasn't the fastest or anything. I'm pretty sure consistently I was the last, the weakest member of our team, you know, because varsity is the top five runners and I'm pretty sure I was five every single year. But I was there, and I showed up, and that's what matters. And going through the abuse years that I did, and being around such a pessimistic energy for so long, it made me lose my faith in myself. And I would tell him that consistently. I would be like, you're making me a worse person. This sucks, you know, because I used to be such an optimistic person. And now I'm realizing I need to get that back. So I started visualizing my dick, you know? Um, ever since I was young, and I didn't have words for it, I've, I've had what is what I can describe as like a phantom limb syndrome, but in my pants like I feel like something is supposed to be there And there isn't phantom limb syndrome usually happens with like the army vets and stuff like that if they've lost uh, An arm or a leg in combat and they will sometimes still feel like it's there um, and for trans men I assume that can <laughs> that's that's what was happening with um, with my dick And so I just needed to get that back. I needed to remember why I'm doing this. This isn't a scary bad thing It's a wonderful amazing thing people would kill to be in my shoes and I need to be grateful that I'm here I'm about to get my dream surgery. I'm about to get my dream body This is the next chapter of my life that's starting this should be an exciting thing I shouldn't be stressed about it and honestly I really really shouldn't because I, I was getting an ulcer in my in my mouth because they're they're caused by stress and you know what the stuff that I'm about to talk to you about I started calming down and practicing and I'm feeling now and the ulcer has disappeared that's fucking wild the mind is so powerful it really does affect our physical well-being what our brain is doing I used to get stress rashes you know and since transition I, I, I haven't anymore brain is so fucking powerful the mind is incredibly powerful it can fuck up or make anything in our body the last couple of weeks I've been doing this exercise where whenever I remember to at least once a day I will say positive messaging to myself and I will repeat the same phrases like my dick is going to heal so fucking well it's gonna be a perfect penis I'm gonna have a perfect arm skin graft I'm gonna have a perfect skin graft that comes from my leg you know my thigh I'm going to heal so fucking well and I'm gonna heal way faster than anyone is expecting and I'm, I'm gonna be so fucking happy and I've been doing that the last couple weeks and remembering last night what my mom would do while she was um, you know recovering from cancer I realized I need to just remember what phantom limb syndrome feels like. I need to just imagine my dick is there, you know? And that's honestly been really helping. I need to go back and remember the state that I was in when I was trying so hard to get this surgery. You know, because we can become a little desensitized when we are about to get the thing. And I need to remember like, oh, I need, I, I wanted this so bad and I still do. We need to go back. We need to remember why we're doing this. So I've just been lounging about, you know, watching Netflix and like right now, I'm just I'm just imagining that my dick is there and it's really helping and it's really feeling it. It's really feeling it. You know what I'm you know what I'm saying? And I felt so much better. Just I just spent 10, 15 minutes just focusing on it and now I can do it without even thinking. And I've also realized something else that is probably impeding my ability to feel like my dick is there is the fact that I'm having trouble feeling my tea dick and that is because I am jerking off every day not necessarily because I'm feeling sexual f feelings not like I feel like jerking off but it's it I'm doing it because I know I'm not going to be able to work at, uh I'm not going to work out you know where my brain is I'm not going to be able to jerk off 
for a while. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, we gotta get this done now. We gotta be on a schedule. And just like when you're trying to make a baby with your partner and y'all have to have sex at a certain time and in a certain position, it has made it not as fun anymore. The, se the sex part, making the baby, I'm sure that's, that's lovely. And you're, you're making a family together. Um, but for me, I, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to jerk off today because my sex drive is pretty high. And so I will just feel my dick throbbing or just something there. And that's, that's why I'm having trouble feeling my dick right now is because I've exhausted, I've depleted myself of cum. And now my, I forget how my dick feels, which is very funny when you think about it. So yeah, I'm not going to jerk off tonight. I, we're just, I'll just deal, you know, like it's not a huge deal. Why, why come if it's not gonna be fun? And we'll see if I jerk off tomorrow. I don't know if I will, honestly. I, I think I, I think I will, just because that's like my last chance. But that's the thing is, I, if I'm jerking off every day, it's not fun anymore. It doesn't feel like an activity that I want to do. I gotta let it build up a little bit, and you know, like jerking off after four days versus after one day, it feels a lot better. So no coming, no coming until. Uh, Tomorrow, at least. And that'll be a lovely treat after I shit out all my bowels that I can have a nice orgasm. <laughs> Jesse can have a little orgasm as a treat. But my mom called today because uh, she was like, yeah, I wanted to call today because... And then she trailed off for a second and then, then, and then said, oh, well, I guess I could call you tomorrow. Got <laughs> talking about Super Bowel Sunday. And I was like, yeah, technically, like, I'm, I'll be al alive. You can talk to me tomorrow. It's just uh, texting is probably better. Mom, um, I don't know if I will be comfortable answering the phone while I am running back and forth to the toilet. But she was like, are you getting excited? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a little nervous, you know? And she was like, oh, you've got nothing to worry about, you know? The, just all the things that I had told myself that I, I needed someone else to say, where she was like, you have some of the best care, like this, this is gonna be really good, Jess. And I said, yeah, you're right. And I told her I was just a little bit nervous. And then unprompted, she was like, yeah, you know, when I had colorectal cancer, I, I pictured, I did a lot of visualization, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I was remembering that, actually. <laughs> yeah, everything's fine, everything's gonna be great. I'm stocked up on coconut water and chicken broth. I've got Andrew on standby just in case uh, I need any more, so he can be a lovely friend and run me up some so that I don't have to leave this room. I'm not leaving this room. A tip for you if you have to go through this, I made sure that I've got the appropriate amount of towels and toilet paper in my room. I, I took care of that uh, yesterday and this morning just to, just to make sure. For each instance of the pain soap, they ask you to put it on a wet washcloth. So I made sure I have enough of the Enough of those. Hey, enough of those, dear. I don't know what I'm doing. What voice is that? I don't know. This is the part of the vlog where I'm going a little stir crazy because I, I'm not associating with many people. Just me alone in a in a room with a camera. I realized one thing that might be a little tricky is that my eyes are dry. As a reminder, I got LASIK this year, and there is a percentage of people who get LASIK that get you know chronic dry eye, and that sucks. I'm using drops like four times a day-ish, just some wetting drops. And I talked to my eye doctor and there's a, there's two options basically. The eye drops that I want to get that would help, unfortunately my insurance doesn't cover them, so they are literally $3,000. Like, they are, they're, whew. And the other option is that I can get, oh, what's it called? A punctal occlusion. And it's a pretty standard procedure um, that like lots of people go through. Not a big deal. But I talked to my eye doctor about that like a couple of weeks before surgery and I was like, yeah, that's, that's really good to know. Not gonna have time for that before surgery. And I've got little twist off individually packaged eye drops where it's like one use where you crack it open. The top looks like a Kool-Aid jammer, you know, one of those where you twist it off and then you um, put it in your eyes. And I'm realizing when I'm in the hospital, that's gonna be an issue just because I, I, you need two hands to twist. And I was trying to think of like, can I just jam it? Can I just Kool-Aid jam it? Is that gonna work? So I also got this while I was at Target committing crimes. Um, it's just an individual, like, this is, uh, I, I use the word individual, but like, that's that's not correct. I assume this would be easier, technically? At least I have the eye drops all in one place. I'm twisting it off now for the first time. Okay, so if I have to do this one-handed. Okay. Yeah, it's possible to do this one-handed. Okay, it's, oh God. 
You're getting the... Ah! You don't realize how hard things are until you just try to do them with one hand. I'm trying... Come on. Ah, oh, fuck. Go back on. Go back on. Put on your little hat. Lance Plasty. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah, it's gonna take a little practice. Um, but it's it, it's better than the individual uh, eye drops. We're gonna have a good time. We're, at, we're gonna have a good time only using one hand for a while. Oh, this is my heat buddy that I brought. Um, if you don't know, I make heat buddies, or I made them years ago with a sewing... I, it was my business before I started doing internet things. Um, they're full of rice and you put them in the microwave and you can put them around your shoulder. Um, my usual, like, my favorite one that I've had for years and years is, uh, green plaid. And this one has dinosaurs on it. I thought it'd be fun to bring. And then I also have the, the pink one that specifically has a strap that my mom got, uh, in the gift shop as a, a present to me, uh, during stage zero. So that straps around my back. Because the thing that I really, like, the thing that was really fucking killing me during surgery was, uh, back pain. Which makes sense because they're flipping you all, all different ways. And I, I woke up with underwear on, you know, like, they, they, they flip you. So your back is gonna be a little fucked up. So this time I have two heat buddies, um, of different purposes. And that will be great. One thing I will warn you about, actually, that I did not know, uh, let me check. I do have feeling back. Okay. For a bit, I did not have feeling um, in this part of my back, and I realized it's because I was heating up the heat buddies during recovery and setting them on my skin for too long. So I was essentially slowly burning away the nerves or something on, on my back, and so I couldn't feel parts of my back for a while, and I thought it was permanent, but it's been however long since surgery, maybe like four months, um, and I have, I'm touching around, seeing how much I can feel, and I, I have regained, um, much more feeling in my back. But just be careful that you're not setting the hot thing on your skin for too long, because I didn't think it was a big deal. I wasn't feeling the burning happening, but that makes sense, because if I'm losing feeling in my back, of course I'm not gonna feel me losing feeling in my back. The more, the, the slower it happens, the more feeling I lose, uh, the more I'm not able to feel when I lose even more. My mom's bringing her laptop, which is nice because I am going to be in some scripting sessions um, for a uh, for redacted project. You probably know what I'm writing for. I don't, I might have even said it. I can't remember. But um, I was a little concerned that, you know, I was talking about before how my headphones kept disconnecting from my tablet. So now I'll have an actual laptop. Laptop to use. I miss, miss Rachel, my dog, my parents' puppy. I've barely gotten to see her grow up, you know, because she's been in Connecticut and I've been everywhere but Connecticut. She's getting big. I was talking to my mom and she was like, Dolly's on my... Oh no. Oh my god, I just called Dolly Rachel, which is the name of my dead dog. Oh no! Oh, the pandemic made me forget that Rachel died. Oh no. Oh. Yeah, I miss, I miss Rachel, but I also miss Dolly. Oh, my puppies. We had Rachel for a long time. She she died when she was like, mm, she must have been like 14 or something. Well, that's a fun slip of the tongue. Oh boy, this pandemic's really fucked with all of us, huh? I miss all my dogs. I miss the I miss my alive dogs and I miss the dead dogs. Since it's been a minute, I thought I would give you an update on the tummy fluff because I was worried. I uh, remember from the the previous stage because they had to shave. Oh God, I can't even remember. My hair has grown back so well that I cannot remember where they had to shave. Well, here is the incisions. So I assume they had to shave, like, right here? But that's great that I can't remember. Um, it's grown back great. Um, if I put my hand here, maybe there'll be some, like, depth perception so you can see. Like, it's very fluffy right here. And for the surgery, I assume they're going to have to shave, like... I assume they're shaving everything from, like, here downwards. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, so, it, at least I know, I, I have more confidence now because this grew, bre bre this grew back fine. Um, so I won't feel as bad uh, with them, you know, shaving that. And, yeah, no, I, I, I will get to keep this so that'll make me feel less uh, dysphoric. I rarely feel dysphoric nowadays, but from 
top surgery stuff, I've, or bottom surgery, rather, I've heard, like, you know, at least in the book that I read, um, he was like, you're going to feel worse before you feel better. Like, it's going to be odd having this thing, even though you want the dick, even though it's, like, something you've always wanted, it's going to take a second to, like, connect with it, especially because I'm not going to be able to feel it at first, um, because the nerve endings are, like, slowly going to start growing back. Um, so, so it'll be nice having a little, little tummy fluff where I'll be able to keep it. But honestly, they could shave all of this and I'd be fine. I'm, I'm glad that it was able to grow back so well in, um, I think it's been four months or whatever. Four months is good. There's a, there's, now I have, it feels better. I've gone through it once and now I know, um, what the situation is going to be. That's what it is now. This is the, the status of how my scars have been healing. I don't even see them. They're so tiny. Um, in the mirror, I'm zo you're zoomed in with a camera, so they appear larger than they actually are, but I don't even register them when I look in the mirror. Um, I have not thought about these scars in months at this point. Um, I've been using this, uh, the CBD salve from Ziggy's Naturals on it, and the last week or so I've been using uh, the Kilo Coat, um, because I was using something similar on my top surgery scars, um, just the little ones here, which are like barely, I don't even know if you can see them. They're, they're barely, barely visible now. Um, but I've been using the, uh, the salve, uh, under here. I don't know. Can you see that? <laughs> I can't see what the camera sees right now, but I've been using it under here and under here. Um, just, just because like the nipples look like this. It doesn't, it doesn't look weird at all. Um, I, I pass perfectly fine. It's not necessary for me to use the salve under there, but I thought I might as well. I have the salve and it's become part of my routine now. So I use it also on my, my little scars here. And um, the past week or so, I've been using the Kilo Coat on, the, uh, on these two scars specifically and also here and here, just because I figured that I'm not gonna have use of my left hand, so I might as well use the best stuff um, possible because I used something similar to Kilo Coat on my top surgery stuff um, and I never used it here on the nipples. I only used it on these two spots. Um, I, I used something similar. It comes, I forget what it's called, but it comes in like a green little squirty bottle that my uh, top surgeon recommended to me and they're barely, barely visible now and it has been two years so it might be just Time and also me working out, the more you're stretching um, and, and filling your your muscles, uh, I'm sorry, filling your uh, chest with muscles, the more it will naturally stretch so that like, you know, scars will be less visible because the more, I'm not a scientist, but I assume the more that they stretch out, the more that they, they're not able to be seen. Um, is there anything else? Might as well sit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm gonna need help applying stuff to my, uh, to my scars now, and there's a whole regimen of, like, the order of stuff that I'm gonna be putting on my scars, um, you know, my arm and my groin and all that stuff. Um, I can't start putting stuff on until after, you know, the stuff is, whatever it's called, is taken off my arm and, uh, you know. I'm realizing now that they did not contact me to say that my insurance didn't cover the Integra. And they also didn't, the, the hospital didn't contact me um, and also didn't ask me on my pre-op to pay anything. So we'll see. Maybe my Integra is covered and maybe the, the, I don't have to pay anything else. We're going to sneak in, <laughs> gonna sneak in through the door and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Oh boy. It'd be so great if I didn't have to pay anything else. Oh my God. What's up, one little last snack, huh? It's funny, I'm actually craving chicken broth, which is one of the only things I can have today. So that's that's good for today, but definitely not gonna have any some now. Definitely gonna have any some now. Definitely have, gonna ain't having, having some now. With me right now, I accidentally have pumpkin pancakes. 
pumpkin spice milk in the fridge and half of that pumpkin tart from Thanksgiving dinner. Didn't do it on purpose. I once identified as a white girl. <laughs> that is one of the advantages of dating a trans man. You get the lived experience of the opposite gender. <laughs> Girls just want a boyfriend who will watch true crime podcasts with them, and you know what, I will. You just want someone with matching Uggs. This chicken is uh, not good, <laughs> but I bought it in a grocery store, so you know. Go pay attention to me, I'm eating grocery store chicken in the dark. My surgery's tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'm getting a dick tomorrow. I think I'm ready. I did some deep breathing exercises and some uh, visualization before I took my little nap, which I thought was going to be a, a deep time sleep, but it wasn't. Just a little nap. I need to acknowledge that there's nothing to be worried about. It's the airplane shit. It's the roller coaster shit, you know? Yeah, this could crash, but let's just appreciate it. Let's, let's assume that it's not going to, because otherwise, if it succeeds and everything goes well, then I just wasted a bunch of time being worried for no reason. And the percentage that, that this could not work is so small. It kind of is just as silly as me worrying that, that my roller coaster is going to crash. They test the roller coasters every day. They're, they're doing this so much. They're running that roller coaster so many times a day. The masculine urge to commit more food sins. Listen, I'm the only one drinking out of this milk. This milk expires on December 2nd. I will have a penis by that time, as we have discussed. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. You know, I, I was just thinking about the part from the 24-hour fundraiser um, where it, it's many, many hours into the stream, I think. It must be at least 15 or 16 hours in, and Daxton has, you know, met up with his friends finally inside the, you know, the dream sphere, and he's walking and he's just like, I'm so tired, you know. I don't, I, I'm so tired. I have to keep going, but I don't, I don't, I'm just so tired. And his friends come along, and, uh, and then Lilith says something to him. I think she's like, but we're here. We got this, because we got this together. And I don't know why I keep thinking about that part. It's just a very memorable Daxton line, I guess. Where me, myself, as Jesse, playing the game. I wasn't tired. We, we'd been awake, you know, so, so long, but I, I wasn't tired, but Daxton was, which is understandable because he's been, you know, physically fighting and, uh, you know, crunching baddies and, and going through these trials, and Daxton wasn't alone. And I'm not alone either. Me, Jesse, right now in this moment. And Daxton wasn't going to stop moving. Sometimes you just need to take a pause to just complain, just event, you know. And it's just a brief little, oh, this is tough, you know. <laughs> and then you can keep moving. Because you just had to, like, let it out. And that's what it was for Daxton. He just, he, he was tired. And he needed to just take a second to acknowledge it. And then he kept going. Yeah, maybe that's why I thought of it right now, because that's what I'm going through right now. I'm not stopping. I'm, I'm full force, let's fucking keep going. But it is tough to accept that I'm about to get what I want. It's something that I've wanted since I was a kid and I did not think it was possible. And now I'm about to get it. And when you've been through a level of people making you scared, you wonder, but not, not too seriously. It just doesn't seem real. It just doesn't seem, this seems too good to be true. What do you mean I'm getting my dick in 24 hours, you know? <laughs> that doesn't, it's not computing in my brain. This is just a little moment. 
I'm just a little anxious and now I'm moving through it. I'm gonna take a second to acknowledge how bonkers this all is. This is a crazy insane thing that my insurance is, is covering so so much of it and I am so blessed and I'm it's so nuts that I'm here. I've been staying in a hotel in Austin by myself and I'm, I'm about to go into surgery tomorrow. I'm about to get my penis tomorrow. Tomorrow. In 24 hours, I will be either starting surgery or it's like, I'll be in the thick of it. And we can pause for a second. Because I've been, I've been running full force for a while. And we can pause for a second to take a breath. And then we'll keep going. Thank you for giving me a chance to vent. Thank you for giving me space to get this energy out. Now let's keep going. Hey babes, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Ask me questions because I'm trapped in this hotel for the next 12 to 15 hours. I'm just gonna be shitting and pissing all day. Give me some stuff. Remember how I told you I got the fancy chicken broth this time? This is the stuff. This is the premium shit apparently. Rich, complex, just like your ideal man. Um, <laughs> I've tried it. It's, it's, I see the difference. I see the difference between just regular Swanson's uh, chicken broth and the crafted roasted chicken broth. It's roasted, that's the, the main word there. I can feel it. I can see there's a difference. Or maybe it's just a placebo. I don't know, chicken broth is chicken broth. But you know what, I'm going to Pretend it's the premium shit, because that's what you do when you have to drink it all day for 12 hours. I might as well pretend it's the good shit. <laughs> Hamilton, Spider-Man, not Peter. I think I'd like to play a different Spider-Man. Maybe a trans Spider-Man would be dope. Um, main character in a supernatural show. The important thing to remember is that their emotional stuntedness or their inability to communicate in any real way isn't your fault. Um, it's way easier said than done, but set boundaries, and if people don't obey them or honor those boundaries, you know, the, and I say, hey, I, I don't want you in my life if you can't treat me with respect, you know. Um, but again, it's way easier said than done. I'm fortunate that I've been able to do that with my situations, um, but I wish you the best, and I hope you know that you're not alone. There's a lot of people um, who are dealing with the, the same thing. It's very tough, whether it's a family member or a friend or anyone in your life who isn't treating you the way you want to be treated. I also just want to tack on a little note here that I'm 29 years old. I have a full-time job. I'm able to live on my own. Um, if you're younger, it, you, it sucks, but you might have to deal with some bad shit for a while. And once you're safe, to come out or to live as your authentic self or to just set boundaries. And this might not even be a queer thing, you know. Um, setting boundaries is good for people. And sometimes the older generation gets mad when you want to set boundaries and be respected as a person. <laughs> See, you're not alone, me talking to the previous question asker. Uh, yet it fucking sucks. And, but it's for the best because you don't want people in your life to make you feel shitty. If your life is gonna be better without them in it, then, then that's the answer, you know. I realize that even though today is going to be a no good bathroom day, um, it is going to be my last day peeing through this specific hole. Specific hole, that's the, the name of my ska band. <laughs> it's the name of my father's gun. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, there's going to be a point, I think it's going to be tomorrow morning, where I'm going to pee in this previous body form for the last time. That's so exciting. What the fuck? That's it's such an interesting thing to think about. Because it's like that, that thing where when I was talking about before where you're a kid and you go outside to play all the time as, as a kid, you know, um, if that's your experience and you live in a neighborhood where you can do that. And then one day you came inside for the last time. Like you, you went outside to play and it was the last time you went out to play and you didn't know it and you didn't keep track of it. And that's what this is going to be like. There's going to be a time where I, but, but, but I'm able to know it <laughs> I, for this specific thing. I will be like, yes, this is the last time I'm using the bathroom and sitting to pee and doing this. Like I will, you know, um, I don't plan on sitting to pee with my penis, but I'm sure there are instances where you, you, you're shitting and then you're like, well, go to pee. Might as well reach this dick 
underneath. Though I might be too big for that. My penis might be too big. I've heard that some guys need to like, if they're using a public uh, toilet to shit, they gotta get uh, tissue, uh, toilet paper, and put it under the penis, because the penis is like lying on the dirty toilet seat, if not, and they gotta like, you know, put some toilet paper under it and kinda just let it rest on top of it. Uh, so we'll see how that works, but... Although I'm gonna be pissing a lot today, I'm gonna be pissing and shitting a lot today. This is, this is it, you know? <laughs> this is, I get to experience one very bad day, very bad toilet day. Um, and then tomorrow morning I will pee for the last time out of this specific hole by our, listen, stream our record on Spotify. <laughs> When you are comfortable and happy being alone, when you're able to pursue activities solo or with friends, and you know, a, a relationship should enhance your life. It shouldn't be a codependent, like, I need someone in my life. So these guys are full of this guy. I want to die. <laughs> I also needed to take four of these, which are uh, Dolcolax laxative tablets. They're very cute. They're teeny tiny. They're smaller than little M&M minis. Um, my ass is about to do something. I have begun poop juice time, but poop juice two, electric boogaloo, electric poopaloo, poop juice poo, electric poopaloo. I don't like it either. So these Dulcolax tabs are the cutest little things you ever did see. They are teeny tiny. They are smaller than M&M minis. They're so small and fragile that they're so clumsy in my hand. And like, I, I dropped two of them. One of them, I don't know where it is. Sorry, hotel staff. And then the other I had to pick up, but like they're so tiny that I don't, they just, they're just dropping. They're, they're very cute. I was able to pop all four in my mouth and just swallow them, no big deal. Uh, I didn't get much of a taste because I was trying to get them down as fast as possible, but I did taste uh, a little of, um, you know, the candy-like coating that they put on some pills. And honestly, the hardest part about these guys, um, is that I had to fit this entire bottle of Miralax. It's, uh, 8.3 ounces, 238 grams. I had to fit this into these two bottles, but there isn't a measurement thing like because they, they expect that you're gonna measure this thing in capfuls but I needed to put this entire thing in both those bottles so I had to just guess I'm in a hotel right now I don't have a measuring cup or anything so I was just like trying to to buy I have my bartending license you know like I haven't used it in fucking forever but I was I was trying to do it by seconds you know like trying to measure each pour by like three seconds like one two three and then I switched to the other one and then I do three more there and I switch it back. And I did that for the entire bottle and I was able to fit it in here, but it took a little bit. You gotta drink a little of the liquid out of the Gatorade because when you're adding powder, it adds volume, right? It, does that sound correct? I think it sounds correct. It sounded smart. Either way, <laughs> I retained some of that, that, uh, that college math. So I had to drink some out of both bottles, pour some more Miralax. Uh, shake it to dissolve it and then drink some more until it was all distributed equally. Now the instructions say drink 8 ounces every 10 to 15 minutes until the solution is gone. You should be finished drinking the Miralax by 1.30 p.m. Now drinking just one flavor over and over was a lot for me so I've been I've been going back and forth you know doing some orange doing some blue uh, and I did the math on that. Um, in, individually, if I was sticking to one flavor, it means that I would be drinking one quarter of a bottle every 10 to 15 minutes. And instead, I'm doing one eighth of each bottle. So I'm drinking one eighth of each bottle every 10 to 15 minutes. And this is a lot of sugar that I'm putting in my body. I, I'm sure they want you to mix it with Gatorade, I think for two reasons. One, one, to, uh, to replenish your electrolytes and shit because, you know, uh, Gatorade has some good stuff in it for you. But yeah, it even says here on the bottle, electrolytes to help replenish what you lose in sweat, carbs to help refuel working muscles. And I will be working a lot of muscles because I will be sweating from all of the shitting that I'm gonna be doing. It's ab day all day, boys! And two is taste, because I was considering just putting all the Miralax in water instead of Gatorade, maybe doing one Gatorade and one water, but uh, I decided against it just because, like, the, the electrolytes and stuff. There must be a measurement of some kind. They're, they're telling me to do it for a reason. And as I was pouring this copious amount of fucking Miralax into both these Gatorade bottles, I quickly realized 
oh, yeah, they it's gonna taste like shit if it's in water. Because, you know, in the past, with the endometriosis that I had, I've, I've had issues with constipation, and so I've used Miralax plenty of times, I've just mixed it in water. And it's fine, it doesn't taste like, you know, anything really, like, it just tastes like weird water and you drink it down. But that is measuring by the, the, the capfuls that they are expecting you to. With that amount of Miralax, it's it's gonna taste like shit, so they're they're masking it in all of the the sugar and the taste of the Gatorade. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, you know with my fainting condition, the thing that triggers it is is a lot of sugar. So I I heated up some chicken broth, and I'm hoping that I don't puke. I don't think I'll puke because I I did I threw up last time from the bowel prep just because it was so so much liquid going in my body and I couldn't handle all of it. So I don't think it was necessarily the sugar. I think it was just liquid. I think worst case I would just like faint um, or get very very fainty. So we'll keep an eye on it, you know, that's all we can do. I have to get this in my body, so you know, fuck it. I also think I greatly underestimated how much chicken broth I need. I might have to have Andrew go pick some up. Update, I've set up the chair uh, cause this is, this is gonna be comfy as fuck. But also I wanted to let you know something that I just checked my bag for that unfortunately I do not have is a Sharpie. And it would have been really valuable, uh, to, to dry off this bottle and mark it in increments of eighths. So I'd be able to know how much I'm drinking at certain times. Uh, so there's a tip for you. Get a, get a dang Sharpie. Oh, it's been 45 minutes and I'm feeling the first rumblings in the tummy. It's starting. Winter's coming. More like John, oh no. Cause it's a shit storm instead of, I had to burp, didn't come out. <laughs> I am supposed to be halfway through. I'm a teensy bit behind. Uh, the sugar is making me faint, but I'm trying to get through it. Uh, no shit yet, but now comes the part where I'm afraid to fart if I feel like there's a fart in my body, because if I'm wrong, it will have disastrous consequences. Ah, uh, poop has happened. Ah, uh, my first bowel movement has happened. It is 1.12, so that's an hour and 12 minutes in. That's, that's when it hit. And also, I realized while I was in there, this is the first trip in a long ass time, years, that I didn't bring my sex bag. You know, because obviously I don't need it anymore. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I just, I feel like that's really a sign that I'm ready, you know? Um, ever since I went back to my visualization, visualization shit last night, um, I've been feeling so much better and so much more comfortable. Um, my anxiety has like way gone down. And, you know, even looking back, the fact that I packed all my shit and didn't think about my sex bag and just moved and like, d now six days into the trip is when I remember that, um, that I don't have it or need it, uh, really shows my mental state of how I've like, I'm ready. Um, I've always been ready. Like, I'm just, I'm ready. <laughs> So I've been passing the time just being on Instagram, you know, because what else am I going to do? I'm stuck in this room. And there's a guy that I follow who got some soap from someone who, you know, a, a queer-owned business. They were like, hey, can I send you soap? And he was like, yeah, sure, and he did a little promotion for it, which was nice of him. And I did a little light internet stalking, as one does. I went to the soap business's Instagram page, and I, you know, looked through the photos because I was interested in soaps. And I got to the guy who owns the business on there, and I'm like, oh, he's hot. And then I looked further and I was like, oh, he's trans, because it says that he's trans. And I looked through all of the posts, and some of them are of soap, and some of them are of him. And it wasn't until I got through all of the posts before I got to one where it was him holding soap, and it was a close-up where you could kind of see the beginnings of right here on his arm. And I noticed that the skin was a di I, I recognized it as like, the skin is a different color. And I was like, did you get fallow? And I went back and looked at the other pictures that I had already seen, and I did not notice a scar the first time I saw. And then I looked and was like, there, I, I, I know what to look for because I've done so much research on it, but a typical person wouldn't be able to... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, a, a typical, you know, cis person wouldn't know what to look for, and some trans people don't even know what to look for. And I love how scars look at everything, but it's it, 
it was very nice to like be like, oh, yeah, the scar looks great. It healed great. And just the, the, the nice coming together of the universe where I would see that now as I am preparing for my own surgery feels really good, you know? Ugh, yeah, I've got three minutes to finish. Uh, I don't think I'm finishing. <laughs> Why the competition? Why the time limit? Why must we compete against our own body? If, if I take another half hour to finish these, these bad boys, what's gonna happen? Why do you need me to consume an entire fucking thing of Miralax in one hour when I have the entirety of all of tonight to shit? It's not a competition to how fast we can shit. If so, I lose. I give up. <laughs> I am not a fast shitter. I haven't shit again. I have this much left of the Gatorades. And we're, we're at overtime now. I have triple checked to make sure that that's the amount I'm supposed to have drunk by, drank by 1.30. I have such a headache, dude. It hurts so bad. It's a lot of sugar going in your body. Um, I just feel like shit. I feel like so bad right now. Um, and I know 100% that it's not from the laxative stuff. It's just because I have a fainting condition and I'm trying to <laughs> shove that much sugar into my body. I have such a headache. And this is not going to be fun for people to watch. So I don't want <laughs> to put too much in it. But fuck, dude. I've just been... I've been... Tr like... I have so much motivation to do things. Like, if I put my mind to it, I'm like, okay, you just got to take, like, one more... Take, like, just some more gulps. We have to get it down. And I've just been laying here like this, just being like, I can't move. I feel so bad. Uh, and it, and I, I don't know if I finished my thought there. Did I finish my thought where I was like, oh, I was going to say, 100% it's not from the laxatives. If I was, if I, if I, it's, it's just, if I had drank that Gatorade without laxatives, if I had drank that amount in that amount of time, I would feel like shit. You know, it's, I feel like shit. <laughs> I don't, I, I, it's so much, it's so much sugar in my body. I, I, I feel like garbage. And I have to finish it. If I finish it by 2.30, I'll be an hour late. How the fuck? What are they, oh, I got a shit. On the plus side, not eating all morning and only having liquids in my body that I have now drained out in the toilet, my muscles look fucking incredible today. And I looked in the mirror and was like, what the fuck? Boop, boop, boo, doo, 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 doo. I can't really move my right pec because I'm holding the camera. Uh, and it doesn't, I have to like be down here. Can I do it here? Boom, 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 boom. I don't know if that'll be visible in the camera because I'm also shaking the camera because my right hand is here. Um, but something I was thinking about was this is also my last day with the use of my left hand for a bit. So I should appreciate that. A um, lot of lasts. A lot of lasts today, but I'm excited about it. My loneliness is killing me and I, I must confess, I still believe, still believe. Can't drink all this Gatorade, but I can fucking do that, huh? <laughs> okay, so the good news is, after a few trips to the bathroom, I do feel better. I, it's, it's, it's a lot of slow building up pressure in, in the intestines and all that. So like, it's like the frog in the hot water where you don't realize how, how hot it's getting. Um, I don't realize how much pressure is being built up until I'm like, well, gotta go to the bathroom, and then I feel a lot better. And I was also just tweeting about uh, Super Bowl Sunday, and someone responded with this tweet, and it is so good, and I don't know how they managed to do a crossover between one of my favorite things and one of my least favorite things, aka Hamilton and shitting. <laughs> but they did it, and I... Um, I keep giggling at it. And this person doesn't know it, but last night I, I listened to Hamilton. I, perf I do a little, a little one-person concert for myself where I perform all of Hamilton's parts in Hamilton. Um, I do this at least once a month because I am a crazy person. I've been rapping since I was a kid. It's my dream to be the first trans actor to play Hamilton. Uh, I'm Mexican and trans and autistic, and I think that'd be a neat person to play Hamilton. I don't know. But 
yeah, I, I, I regularly do rapping as a way of uh, warming up before voiceover jobs. And I needed something that got me back to my roots and made me feel powerful and strong. I needed to remember what I was like before I got here to Austin and was like having anxiety because of surgery. Pre-surgery jitters. And I was like, you know what? I should fucking, I should do some Hamilton. And I did, and I, it feels great. And the fucking phrase, do not throw away your shot, fucking got to me again. Everything always comes back to Hamilton. And I was like, fuck, yeah, Jesse, this is it. This is your shot. Do not throw away your shot. It's corny and stupid, and I'm a dumb fuck theater nerd, but fuck it. Ugh, it's 2.53 and I'm very far behind. This has to be a test, right? They have to say, oh, this person will never finish this amount of Gatorade in only an hour, so we should start them early so that they like try to push as much as possible, as fast as possible at the beginning, and then they're just gonna take their damn time doing the rest of it, right? This can't be... Who who can do this? I wanna meet you. What the fuck are you doing that you can consume this amount of Gatorade in an hour? With Miralax in it. How are you? You're not human. This is bullshit. My boy Andrew just dropped off some more chicken broth. Uh, this is H-E-B brand. If you don't know, it is, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Is there a light just on me right now? <laughs> I was trying to focus, and I could not. I was getting overstimulated. Anyway, H-E-B <laughs> is the, uh, the Texas brand grocery store that I, uh, I, I went to with my mom, and we, we talked about it in Pink Blue episode, whatever the fuck, the one that was about stage zero. But yeah, I greatly underestimated how much chicken broth I would need. Um, so we're gonna see if this is any good. Okay, one bottle down. And I've also realized why the time limit. They want me to start an enema at 5 p.m. Which is, <laughs> they wanted me to finish the Gatorade at 1.30 p.m. They wanted me to shit as much as possible and have everything be like chill and cool before I do the enema. So that's probably what it is. They wanted it to give enough wiggle room that it's like, hey, even if you fuck up and you can't drink the Gatorade as fast as possible, we will, you should do an enema at 5 p.m. So like, get everything, get it done. Come on, clock's a ticking. I feel so terrible. It's hot. it's just the sugar. It's so, it's so much. Cause also I, me, my diet personally, I only drink water. That sun is incredible. I only drink water. So this amount of this in my body, it's overloading my senses. 100% would rather do this than the poop juice though that I had to do in stage zero. That was unbearable. Because at least this tastes good. It's just the effect in my body that it's having afterwards is not fun. Let's fucking do it. Let's fucking do it. Fuck. Ah, fuck yeah. Hold on. I want to spike it like a football. There's the cap. Ah, wait. Fuck yeah. <laughs> You're going too. The other one's going too. Super Bowl Sunday. I wasn't even trying to do a parallel with that. I just, I just want to just, I just want to throw them. Sometimes you just want to throw something. The masculine urge to just throw something. Fuck. Okay, now, now I can have some chicken broth. Oh, wait, we forgot one. Ha <laughs> ha. Fuck you. Son of a bitch. Do it again. Why? Go that way, fucker. The bowels are empty. We did it, besties. Oh, fuck. Um, you know, it's it wasn't as bad as the stage zero poop juice that they had me doing. I'm still running to get the water out of my ass, but the bowels are done. <sighs> okay, so I luckily took notes. Because <laughs> I've been away from the camera for a while. I'm still feeling the urge to shit, so I will get up every once in a while uh, to, to do that while recording this. But I did the enema when it was time to do the enema. Uh, first I did my tea shot because we were, were doing, you know, the tea shot on the Sunday instead of Monday slash Tuesday. <sighs> Sorry, I feel like shit. <laughs> I can't get warm. I tried putting on the heat. It's not doing enough. So it hurt a lot less, uh, the enema this time, uh, inserting it. Last time for, for stage zero, inserting the enema hurt really bad. And I'm realizing it's because the poop juice that I had to consume that time, um, really wrecked my ass. It really, it hurt a lot. So my asshole was already raw by the time I had to do the enema. Um, cause like, that's, that's insane. Last time when I did stage zero, I was having, I was bottoming consistently. So my, I was, I was confident in my ability for my ass to be able to sp stretch, it'd be fine. And then it hurt really bad. And I was like, maybe I'm a bad bottom, but no, aha, I'm not. 
uh, this time, I haven't, I haven't, no one's been in, well, last time anyone has been in my ass is, is been like, three, four weeks ago, I think, and that was, it's like, just once, I, two people have been in there one time, uh, not the same time, <laughs> that'd be amazing, wow, I wonder if I had, uh, Mr. Fantastic stretching powers, but the point I'm trying to make is that I was way more flexible last time, and it hurt more, and this time, not at all, um, and it didn't hurt that much at all. So yeah, I, I definitely prefer this uh, poop juice method, uh, where we put the Miralax in the Gatorades, even though it has made me horribly ill. I did the enema, and then a minute later I felt the urge to sit on the toilet. They say, like, this should produce a bowel movement in one to five minutes. I did that, it fucking hurt, I suffered through it, you know? I was like, you know, <laughs> it was, I was in the middle of, like, shitting my guts out. And just being like, you know what? It hurts to make art. Sometimes you have to hurt to make art. And your penis is the best piece of art that there will ever be. And it got me through it. Um, and I, I came into the, the bedroom. I went back and forth, pooping for a bit because of the enema. And I was getting frustrated because my, my poop started being just clear and yellow. And I was like, ah, oh, man, like, I'm not... Am I gonna have to use the second enema? No poop is coming out. And then eventually I just became too tired. I just became very weak uh, and tired and cold and I couldn't get warm. So I went under the covers and I must have slept. I must have passed out sleeping because um, I woke up like an hour or two later. And then once I got up, I was like, you know, moving around, I was like, yo, I'm awake. So maybe my body will want to shit again. Maybe I can just get the shit out of my body and started the rumblings, and I was like, okay, good. Went, pooped again, but it's still clear and yellow. And I'm like, what the fuck? I, I don't want to do the second enema. I'm so, I feel so ill. I don't, I, <laughs> please don't make me build a second enema. I just remember that scene from Dracula Dead Loving It, where he's just like screaming and like they're pulling him back for another enema. And he's like, not another enema. That was, that was me. Just at that moment when I come back, to, to chill out and, and hydrate because I've been asleep and I realize, oh, I need to start, I need to keep hydrating. So I was about to drink some coconut water when I got a text from my mom, which was very nice. She said, heading to bed now. Know that I love you, know that you're in great hands, and know that I'm just a text away. I'm leaving my phone on, so if you need me for any reason, I'm available for you. Don't forget to text me when you make it to the hospital or ask Andrew to text me. This is amazing what you're about to do. I'm so proud of you. And a little hearts emoji. And, and she signs her name with hearts for the O, so she, for mom, so she does M, hearts, M. And this time she did the same little two hearts, which is funny, because that's t two hearts I'm realizing. Usually she does one heart, but I guess she wanted to do two hearts just to mix things up, but now it says boom, <laughs> which is very funny. <laughs> but anyway, I take this opportunity to text her. So I said, thanks so much, love you too, and I did, a, I did a regular heart. And I said, oh, also, is there a way to tell if your bowels are empty? They said to do the second enema at 10 if my bowels aren't empty. Because again, she went through colorectal cancer. She, 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 the expert, I should ask her. She said, yes, when your poop is coming out yellow, not brown, what color poop is coming out? And I was like, oh, thank fuck, okay, it's a good sign. It's good that my shit is just yellow and clear and doesn't look like shit. Which makes sense, because if your bowels, if, there's, if, there's, if they're empty and there's nothing to produce, they're just gonna keep shitting out the water that I have shot into my anus. Speaking of which, I gotta go do that right now. <sighs> I know this part might be hard for you to watch. I know it's not fun to see me like this, but don't worry, this, this is the part of the movie where the hero is really weak before he starts kicking ass. I'm gonna make some, uh, some broth, and I'm gonna put that in my body, because I need to stop eating. Um, like anything and drinking anything at midnight. So I will stop shivering and just make some broth. I'm just very grateful that I don't have to do the second enema. I think I should have I should have asked my mom. She was right there um, for stage zero whether I should have done the second enema or not, but I think I, I just did the second enema just to be safe last time because I just wanted to be sure because I don't know what happens if, if there's shit in your bowels when they go to do stuff. I'll also give you a, a last view of, of my arm. Um, but I don't know if I'll do that yet. I think I need to do the broth first so that I can hold my arm still. Again, don't worry. This is, this is fine. I've been through worse. 
Let's do this. You know, no one tells you a side effect of an enema is temporary insanity. <laughs> Soup! The stage one arc. Yesterday, Andrew um, didn't know the name of it, so he said, Act one. That's This is act one. And you know what? Fucking it is. <laughs> I kind of love that. It all comes back to the theater. Man, if I could just go back and just let that little guy know, you know, when I when I was uh, when I was doing theater when I first started acting, I'd be like, hey, you're playing male roles, and um, you're gonna keep playing male roles. There's a, you know that picture of me dressed up for uh, guys and dolls because I played nicely nicely Johnson in eighth grade. It's my fucking range, dude. I'm a great actor. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I'll shit on myself for. But I'm good at acting. I'm so good at acting that I can stealth and I pretended that I was a girl for fucking so long. The range, baby, the range. Eighth grade, I played Nicely Nicely Johnson. Senior year of high school, I was nominated for a Halo Award for playing Miss Mullins in Carousel. If you're not familiar with Carousel, there are two different ways you can play Miss Mullins. You play her as a raggedy hag who's like ugly and old and just like flirting with the main character and she's got no shot with him. Or you could play a voluptuous version where she's got big boobs and, like, you know, is, is beautiful and is, you know, trying to fuck the main character. Guess which version I played? It was the sexy one. And I was so good at it, I got nominated as a, a, a fucking award. And I didn't win the Halo Award, but uh, shortly before that I did win the, the overall school awards for, for acting. I won... Uh, best secondary character or something like that. The point is, musical theater changed my life. Ah, it gave me an outlet, showed me that I'm really good at something, and that's another thing that my mom really supported me in, you know? Cause she got me uh, acting lessons at age six because I, I really wanted to do it. And now I'm here. I've been in projects that have been on, like, covered on playbill.com. I have characters in anime, and I'm working for Team Four Star, we have millions of subscribers, I think. I don't know. Million sounds correct. I never checked the popularity of things that I'm in. So what am I ranting about? What, what is my delirious ass ranting about? I'm saying that, of course I'm talking about musicals. In my most weak state, uh, in my most vulnerable state, I am returning to talking about musicals and shit. I'm finally able to live as my authentic self, which means that I can play roles as my authentic self. I was always gonna play men. I was always, you know, playing male roles, but now, now it makes sense. And it's, um, you know, it's funny, because if we think about abridging, it's just, all, it, it, it's very male dominated. It was just a lot of dudes, and I was popular because I was, I was one of the only not ones, and now it's like, oh no, I was the whole time. In my weakest state, I'm talking about the things that matter the most to me, and you never know. And it's it, you never know what it is until you're there. It's like when you're drunk, you realize what kind of drunk you are. And when I'm drunk, I am the kind that I just want everyone to be having a good time. And I tell people that I care about them, and I follow my friends around like a little puppy. Sometimes it's good to know that my weekend stay here is theater nerd, but grateful theater nerd. I love you. Thank you for being here. I had soup and I feel a little better. I'm not sure what I'll do now. Perhaps check social media. I'll tell you what I'm not gonna do, a second enema. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still got some hair in this strip uh, of my arm right here because I didn't know whether we should take it or not. I wanted to take the least amount possible and then after the penis is made, we can do more hair removal if necessary. Yeah, I've been using um, scent-free lotion on it every night. And then I've been using this stuff, which I've heard is good for, not rosacea, is it rosacea? I don't know, certain skin conditions. Um, and this used to be a lot worse. The, the red bumps, they're like barely visible now. I only see them because I'm looking for them, but uh, they used to be worse and I've been using that every, uh, every night for the last, three or four months and it's uh, cleared it up so yeah we're almost there buds I just took a shower and I'm having one of the Paw Patrol fucking popsicles because they're gonna go to waste anyway 
And uh, they have a joke on them, so let's find out once I'm done with this. I melted it in the sink. I only wanted a little bite of it. I don't want to get too sick. Because, um, you know, I only have an hour left to drink more. But, uh... <laughs> you ready? What do these cop dogs think is funny? What did the farmer say to the green pumpkin? Why orange you orange? Well, I might as well quit writing. Can't get better than this. Two more minutes. I've got coconut water. It's something that I used to drink when I was a cross country runner. So I've been jamming on this. Nowadays, I drink coconut water, and as I'm drinking it, it goes from a good taste to a bad taste to a good taste to a bad taste. Just over and over. I've never drank anything quite with that quality where it just consistently goes back and forth where I'm like, I like this, and then maybe not. I got my little cart ahead of time because I have four fucking bags. <laughs> um, and I, I brought the, the little rolly luggage cart up to my room. Mm, ended on a bad taste there. Don't like it. Perfect. <clears throat> no more fluids. I had a little bit more uh, chicken broth before this. Pencils down. Now we wait. I don't think I can sleep. I have to get up in four hours anyway. This is kind of a sour note. I don't know if I'll keep this in. Maybe. It's a good note. I was looking through my Facebook, uh, you know, the, the, on this day a year ago or two years ago or whatever the fuck that pops up. It popped up that two years ago was when I almost got hate crimed on a Tinder date. And um, now I'm here. And it was such a big deal to me years ago, you know? I was so scared and I felt so alone. It hit me at a, at a, a time where I really needed people on my side, I guess. I, it, was, it was at the time where just a lot of bad things were happening at the same time. Where I was trying to gain back my trust in people and then Things like that happened. Um, and I think individually, if just one of them had happened, I'd be able to tackle it. But it, it, um, it set me into a, a bad spiral because I, you know, I wasn't as, as solid on my hormones back then. I was, uh, I think I was still on bi-weekly shots instead of weekly. So my hormones were like, I don't think I was able to cry. But long story short, it is the one and only time that I have called the uh, trans lifeline, the, the trans specific suicide uh, prevention hotline. And I don't know if I've talked about that here. I called the suicide hotline and I was on hold. <laughs> they put me on hold um, for like, I wanna say a whole 10 minutes. It was a long hold time. And then they hung up on me and I just started laughing. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's too funny. And I have friends who have had similar uh, situations. Uh, my my ex-partner Dash, they're a stand-up and they have a joke uh, that they used to tell on stage about um, when they had to call a, hot, uh, a suicide hotline. And like, and someone picked up on the other line. It was very enthusiastic and like, was just like, the, the vibe was all weird. And then he ended up hanging up on them. And they were like, well, I can't, <laughs> can't kill myself now. That's too funny. And I, you know, fully, I think that it, you know, it could strike someone at the wrong time. But I also think they do that on purpose to like snap you out of it because it honestly did snap me out of it. But I called back and uh, I got to talk to someone and that was nice. And now I'm here, you know, and it, it, it's not a big deal to me at all. That bad experience I had years ago, I, I saw that on Facebook and I didn't feel anything bad. I was just like, man, I'm so fucking lucky that I'm here. I'm, <laughs> wow, almost to the day. Who could have predicted that? I'm so happy. I'm fully in it now. The, the, the repetition and the visualization that I was doing before where I'm like, my penis is gonna heal so fucking well. Perfect penis, perfect arm graft, perfect skin graft. I'm gonna heal way faster than anyone thinks 
I am, I'm gonna be so fucking happy. I said it enough to myself enough times that I believe it. And... Oh, I gotta shit again. <laughs> ah, okay. I am so fucking ready. I said it enough to myself that I believe it now. I don't even have to try. I'm just, I'm fully feeling it. I trimmed my nails. I trimmed my beard. I washed my hair. And y'all know how this story ends, and I do not. That's a funny thing to think about. But I think I know how it ends. So, you might be on the same page. I do end up getting some sleep, actually. When my alarm wakes me up, I discover I am hungry, my asshole hurts, I'm weak because I'm hungry, I'm weak because I'm faint because I can't take my pills. And I've also never felt stronger in my entire life. I set my clothes out ahead of time the previous night so that I would not have to think about it. <sighs> so we meet again. <sighs> Feeling good. I'm feeling really good. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Let's do this. Yeah, peep the fit. This is what we are <laughs> wearing today. Um, including the the very nice socks that have bananas. I have to put this camera away now. Gotta pack it up with one of these bags with the tripod. I'll see you on the other side. I'm sorry you gotta go in there for a little bit, buddy, but I'll see you in a sec, okay? I brought this coat because it's a little bigger, you know? And around the, uh, the arm sleeve, that's, that's gonna be important. And it's funny because it's got a scorpion on it, and then boom, Spider-Man. If my thing will reveal, ha-ha, uh -huh. whoa, whoa, woof, whoa, whoa. Got the power of both a spider and a scorpion. Uh, that sounds cool. But I mean, a scorpion is basically a, well, no, I shouldn't say that. I haven't interacted with enough scorpions to know if they're, they're just pinchy spiders. Anyway, I have to go. <laughs> Thank you for letting me poop in you. Goodbye now. We get to the hospital and I realize just how thirsty I am. I'm so fucking thirsty. I, speaking of which, I didn't jerk off again. I, I don't know, I just felt like I was ready. You know, I was like, eh, I'm good. Ready for the next step. Let's, let's uh, do it. When you know that filet mignon is awaiting you on the other side, the, the McDonald's burger just, it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> I didn't really want to go on my phone in the waiting room. I just kind of watched the fish as they went around because they, they kept like getting mouthfuls of like rocks and food off the floor and then spitting out <laughs> the rocks because they can't eat the rocks. And you know what? I want to live my life that way. Just, just scooping up everything, but only taking what is valuable. I think we should all aspire to be <laughs> like those aquarium fish. The nurse printed out a bracelet for me and put it on my right wrist and asked me to confirm the info was correct. And you no, know, that's pretty standard. I've done it a million times and I, I haven't looked terribly hard at the info just because I don't I don't know if I'll see something I don't want to see. But this time when I said, yes, it's correct, I really meant it. My sex was marked as male. I didn't feel anxious after that. They took me back, told me to put my possessions in a bag, and I put on a, a paper gown, and I sat on a bed. And then a whole parade of different, everyone started coming in and out of the room, many different nurses, anesthesiologists, and Dr. Santucci, who wrote something on my left hand before he left to finish preparing. But it felt very nice that he came in also and was like, you ready? And I was like, fuck yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> One nurse went over basically all the info I'd already submitted already, which felt like a job interview, you know, where you have to relay your entire resume, only this time I was naked in a little paper gown and couldn't get her the info she needed when she asked for things. Where's my pharmacy address? Oh yeah, let me pull Google Maps out of my asshole. She asked if there was any chance that I was pregnant, and I was like, oh, 100% chance no. <laughs> and she was like, all right, yeah, because you got a hysterectomy. And I wanted to say, no, it's because I, I don't use that for sex. <laughs> None of this bothered me, of course. The bracelet said male. Everyone gendered me correctly. This was the best medical experience I've ever had. <laughs> because present Jesse narrating this, you know, I, I took notes and now I'm narrating this in the present. Uh, you know, I'm uh, right now as I'm narrating this, I'm about uh, six weeks uh, post-surgery. I am so happy and comfortable and confident. 
And I can pinpoint that when I saw the bracelet, that was the start of it. Like that was the start of me being like, oh, right. Like the right, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm just happy. It really was the best medical experience I've ever had. And it also seemed to be the shortest because I remember being wheeled to another room. And then the next thing is that I'm awake being wheeled into a third location. There were a bunch of nurses and stuff talking over my body and talking about like, I can't even remember what they were talking about, but it was so quick that I was like, did we do it? <laughs> is it done? Uh, and they were like, yeah. And I was like, was it a success? Were we successful? And they were like, yeah, no, we're good. You got your penis, bud. Everything, everything was great. <laughs> everything went so great, actually, that we finished early. Um, I found out that uh, no hat for my boy. Uh, for but that's fine. They're gonna have to make me circumcised on uh, on the next go around for stage two. Uh, but honestly, totally fine. I'm glad that I was briefed on that ahead of time. And, uh, you know, like I, some of the, the skinnier guys, uh, like he said, the skinnier guys, sometimes they, they don't, they, they got to get it around the next time and that's fine. You know what? I'll have a bris and it will, <laughs> and who gets to experience both who gets, I think it's a rare amount of men who get to experience having an uncircumcised penis and having a circumcised penis. So you know what? I'm fucking ecstatic. And when they described how well the surgery went with all the different parts of my body, they used almost the same language I was using in my visualization. And it felt just complete. Ugh. Like, I, I didn't cry. And I think the drugs prevented it. But holy shit, I am on top of the world. They wheel me into the room that I will be staying in for the week in the hospital. And they put these things on my legs that's basically to help circulate blood flow. Because you're going to be laying down. Uh, I'm not allowed to walk for a few days. And they want to make sure that uh, my legs are getting the proper blood flowing through them. And it's kind of like popping Pillsbury biscuit dough. It, it sounds and feels like airbags going off. No warning. Like it'll go in and then it'll just go poof. And then you hear it deflate. And then it inflates again. And it makes me face my fear of car accidents head on because <laughs> I'm just hearing it. And it was like, you know, obviously PTSD is not a thing that you just throw someone in the deep end for. But for me, it was very helpful because <laughs> I was just forced to just be in this anxious situation. But I was on drugs, so I was not anxious for it. And uh, and it was uh, it was beautiful <laughs> to just hear them going on and off all day, every day for for many days it would be. I became desensitized pretty quickly. The The operation made me stronger in literally every way. Someone has to come in every hour and listen to my penis, which sounds like the ocean. <laughs> it's, um, it's a Doppler. A Doppler something or other. You'd have to look up the exact, I, you know, description of it, but I, I know it's called a Doppler. And I have many, many nurses for this entire stay, so I'm going to be just labeling them with letters. I meet Nurse A, who advocates for me and wants to make sure she understands what I want and makes me comfortable. She's great. Um, she's frustrated that the previous nurse handed me off to her with my penis leaking from my tip. Not because she has to clean it or anything, but rather just because she said that's not comfy for me to be sitting in. My dick has a little light, and I can see it in the dark because it's dark in the room. Um, and it's a, a literal flashlight. <laughs> E.T. phone home jokes here. I, of course, cannot show you a picture of my penis, but I can give you this beautiful artist rendering, which is me on drugs uh, drawing it for Twitter. <laughs> Something I didn't tell you about the mini fridge at my hotel is that it sounded like the ocean at night, like slight calming waves. And I didn't think it would matter. I didn't think it'd be foreshadowing. But now in that moment in the hospital, the lights are off and it's nighttime at the dock and it's beautiful. My perfect penis lighting the way, warning sailors of impending crash. Everything is right with the world. The worrying was for nothing, of course it was. I'm not allowed food or water in case I need more surgery, so there's a, there's a certain amount of hours that I just, I can't have food or water and, oh boy. And you know, that totally makes sense, but if you remember, I have a fainting condition, dear viewer, and I am so happy that I think that alone will sustain me. I, th I think I'm so happy that I could just power through it. You know what? It's good. Everything's fine. 
surely I can exist in this pure state of unshakable happiness and nothing will hurt me. Um, well, it matters now that I've had 64 ounces of Gatorade. <laughs> uh, anyway, as Nurse B enters to take over the night shift, Nurse A explains how everything's gone so far, and I feel the oh-so-familiar wave that had plagued me since childhood, the wave of faintness, and I try to ride it out, but as I see them talking, they look at my machine, which is making lots of noises all of a sudden, and I know what's about to happen. They ask if I'm okay as my heart rate drops to zero. I say that I've answered them, but I have lost consciousness. And fainting is such an interesting thing <laughs> because I wake up like back into the world and I'm looking and they're, they're looking at me so seriously. And Nurse A is loudly telling me to open my eyes and wake up. And I'm like, yeah, I am awake. Do, do you think I'm not? <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure that's what I was doing. Um, but I must not have been. I must have been passed out. And time sometimes gets fucky with fainting. I learned later that they had been asking that for a bit. They were like, oh, no, wake up. Uh, they were telling me that for a bit. And when I finally vocally responded, that's when I actually responded to it for the first time. They tilt me totally flat because my, my bed had been a little elevated at that point, you know, to sit me up a little. And they laid me down flat because that's, you know, usually the way to help me not feel faint. Uh, and they try to calm me down with ice chips, which I shouldn't have because I no food or water. I'm trying to not have food or water in case I need more surgery. But like I, I need ice chips or I'm going to die. Um, and they also give me these Q-tip things dipped in a lemon substance i'm not sure what they were i was very high at the time um but i described them as lemon q-tips um and when i needed to ask for more that's what i asked for <laughs> nurse a wasn't even supposed to be there that night so i feel bad she had to deal with my faint ass nurse b is also lovely uh she wears a leather jacket over her scrubs and she's beautiful uh this sounds like a fan fiction <laughs> eventually after knowing each other for a bit like gauging the vibe i say that i'm mexican on my father's side and i ask where her accent is from and i was right she's mexican too and there's just the tiniest language barrier between us it's barely any at all but sometimes um you know i'll, I'll say something and she doesn't understand or, or something or other uh, but it's it's barely noticeable at all and i learned she's only been here for five years but she studied in el paso around others who just spoke spanish so she's hoping she'll get even more fluent in english you know being here and i'm like i i know that she totally will the more you're around a language the more that it sticks i talked about how i wasn't raised with my father so it's part of myself that i've been trying to rediscover lately you know my my hispanic uh and i'm doing duolingo and all that and she says she was doing the same for portuguese and i said my grandma was mexican and and portuguese and what a what an experience to have now me as present jesse who is putting this all together i think that's where we'll end the video because the next episode is going to be recovery stage one recovery and let me tell you i am going to be very entertained trying to figure out the notes that very high on morphine Jesse wrote in the hospital with one hand. I need to figure out what I meant by some things. Um, and I'm very excited to get to that. But thank you so much for joining me. And um, this is going to be a chonky video, I'm sure. But this is such a trip. Like, just a side note, as me, present Jesse, six weeks post-surgery, putting this together. Um, no spoilers, but fuck, man, this was one of the greatest experiences of my life and looking back on these notes and remembering what I was going through in the beginning like I'm so fucking happy you know I'm um, I'm still in recovery right now no spoilers as to what I'm going through right now but barely anything like super great I'm I'm remembering like, oh, wow, I went through a lot of pain and, um, you know, stuff to, to get here. And I'm so thrilled that you got to join me for that. Um, yeah, I won't say any more. I don't want to those spoilers. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and, uh, and I'll pass it over to Jesse, who will do the, the Patreon shout outs. Uh, go ahead. Do it, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. I want to give a special shout out to all my wonderful patrons over at Patreon. You literally make these videos possible. That's not just a weird sponsor thing that I'm saying. I, these, they're, these videos are as 
detailed and everything because you get to make it possible. And thank you for supporting my dumb bullshit uh, that will further humanity in some way, I'm sure. Um, I want to give a special shout out to my silver sponsors, Alex Buner, Andrew Dunn, Kieran Benson, Cyberlink420, Dan Millington, Dan McRae, Gatterine, Giselle Nara, Jean-Baptiste Rousey, Luan Evren, Marie Byrne, Neve Kinor, Official PSI, and Pocket Jawa. Guess who's next? It's my gold sponsors, Alex Shep, Alarix, Doran McEwen, and Sam Bartram. Last but not least, let's throw it over to the Diamond sponsors. Ooh, ooh, I don't know what I'm doing. Ipam, Getty Skog, and Sukiyomi. Thank you so much. Wonderful patrons. And you, even if you're not my patron, thank you for watching. And, you know, th th uh, thank you to my patrons because they're making these videos possible for you, who's just a casual viewer. And uh, thank you for... I just want to thank everyone. This fucking rules, man. Like, all this fucking shit fucking rules. Um, I'm able to do whatever the fuck I want on YouTube. Uh, I mean, as long as it's, you know, within reason. Um, and it's because you're throwing me some, some pocket change on, uh, Patreon to make these, uh, silly, silly videos about my painless. I'll see you in the next one. I hope you have a healthy and safe day, weekend, night, whatever you're going through. I hope you get through it. Sometimes the only way out is through. And if you need that advice right now, I hope, I hope it helps you. <laughs> I don't know. Some people might. Sometimes you just need to hear that. I'm kind of rambling. Let's go. Aha! <laughs>